mass, um, but that includes oyster well, river exeter. Marsh, yeah, Zach just left that. Okay. I don't know how I missed this part. Can I have everyone's attention, please? Um, Welcome to the August 9th, 2022 school board meeting, Portsmouth School Board meeting. Um, it's nice and cool in here. I hope you're all cool where you are out there in um, the community. Um, okay, we will start by having the roll call. Uh, Elizabeth Barrett. Pip Clues. Here. Lisa Rappaport. Here. Ann Walker. Here. Margaret Peabody. Here. Nancy Kleiberg. Here. Hope Van Epps. Here. Brian French. Carrie Nolte. Here. Kim McGuinchy. Here. And Nick Dowen. Here. Great. Thank you. Okay. Would everyone like to stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Okay, we have some announcements and recognitions that we want to start off with. Zach, do you want to talk about the um, CTE recognition? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just uh, mention we, we pushed it out to uh, Parent Square uh, tonight and out to Facebook uh, for folks in the community who are interested, but our uh, CTE director, Courtney Richings uh, was um, was awarded through I think it's the Greater it's the Collaborative Chamber of Greater Portsmouth um, in association with Partners Bank. She was uh, recognized as the Collaborator of the Year uh, for that organization. Uh, and when they talk about how they identify people, uh, they're looking for um, for individuals who help make Portsmouth a better place to live and work. Uh, and so it was quite the recognition for Courtney, the work that's being done at uh, the CTE. Uh, and uh, I encourage people, that group developed a short video about, about Courtney and about Courtney's work. Mm -hmm. That's available now online, and I would encourage our uh, community to take a look. Uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a tribute both to Courtney and her leadership, what she brings to the table. Uh, um, I think as most of you know, she had great state experience before she, uh, she came to us. And the CTE continues to be uh, a, a really wonderful conduit of um, collaboration between the business community and nonprofit community uh, and uh, the school district. So I think we are uh, well positioned to continue to expand those opportunities and those partnerships. And we're very lucky to have Courtney at the helm. Thank you. Does anyone else have an acknowledgement or an announcement that they would like to make? Okay. Do you, Carrie? I do. Oh, go ahead. Well, I think it's collectively, but um, I think this is, will be Kim McClinchy's last school board meeting with us. And I have only been here a short time, but we know that we really appreciate all of the work and her guidance for us here. And we'll be sad to see you go, but happy for new adventures. Well, good. Thank you so much. Kim has been with us for 15 years, oh my gosh. and she's going to Marshwood High School as an assistant principal, and she will be sorely missed here. Um, not only was she a fabulous science teacher, as you all know, but she um, was in charge of many, many exciting projects at Portsmouth High School, like We Speak, the Equity Council, the environmental um, efforts that the high school has done. What else, Kim? Am I forgetting? It? <laughs> <laughs> Liam, I don't know. A lot of things. Portsmouth 400. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. Yeah. Portsmouth 400. About the yes. student fair. Yes. And, Lots um, of fun things. I, I do love engaging in Portsmouth, and I'm going to miss it very, very much. Um, I feel like I have like the roots of an oak tree somehow in this community, and I'm trying to um, pull them out slowly, but. Um, yeah, I'm going to miss it very much. And you guys have been great. And like I said in my letter of uh, resignation, um, it's it's never the the you know the individual. It's it's the environment. Um, and so when you have an environment, you know that helps people thrive and and bring things to the next level. It's it's more about the environment than that actual person. So thank you for the the great environment. I, I appreciate Kim's understatedness about her own value uh, and simultaneously you know one of the things that um, appealed to me about coming to this um, this district was uh, a clear 
from the board and from others a clear sense of the importance of social justice issues um, for the community. And, and in, um, you know, it's been, become very clear to me that Kim, in a variety of ways, is the torchbearer for those issues for the, for the school district. So, so I think as we can be excited for her and her opportunity to, to uh, take the next step uh, in the profession and congratulate Marshwood on a great hire. And at the same time, know that we've got some big shoes to fill. Um, and it might be a couple different people have to sh fill some shoes in order to carry all the, all the good stuff that uh, Kim was carrying. So thank you. Thank you. And Kim, thank you. You've been a wonderful school board rep. Kim's been on our school board for how many years now? Well, since uh, Leslie four? was here, I feel like it's like almost eight years. How long yeah. has Leslie been gone? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. No, okay. it's been I think a while. Ann was our first teacher oh. rep on our school board. And you know, you guys contribute so much. It's wonderful to have you on the board to give the perspective that you can give us. And uh, we appreciate that also. Great. You've thank been you. one busy woman in, uh, <laughs> in our school district. So thank you. Thank you so luck. much. Okay, let's move on to accept acceptance of minutes from our July 13th, 2022 board meeting. Do we have a motion to accept? Second, and second? Second. Lisa? Lisa second. Um, all in favor? Any, Aye. Uh, any discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. <clears throat> okay. Public comment. Do we have anyone out there that would like to speak <clears throat> to our board? And I guess we no longer have Zoom, correct? So we don't have no, Zoom? We do. Okay. We do? Okay. Oh, are okay. We, okay, we, not, we do not we have don't any, have Zoom? No, we do have Zoom. We sent out a Zoom link. Yes, we oh, do we did. have Zoom. Okay. We're not turning it on. Okay, do we have anyone on where Zoom? Is Nathan? It? <laughs> Patty? <laughs> if we have it, where is it? Yeah, I know. We should I, be I am not connected at all. So there's major okay. issues here. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll work on that. Okay, let's move on to our special <laughs> presentation. We are pleased tonight to have <laughs> members of our um, city here. Go ahead. Well, wow. here, go, he's going to shut up the Zoom for public well, there's, comment. There's no Zoom oh, there. um, and I, I reached out to Paulette and there wasn't a Zoom link on the agenda. Oh. That's why I didn't oh, think there was one. Agenda. Okay. Oh. All right, thank you. Okay, we have our wonderful city manager, Karen Kennard, and she's going to yeah, I I'm sorry. Can we, just I'm sorry. In, can we create some Who's, sort of decision with that to eliminate uh, Zoom from public meetings? I'm not. Uh, I'm know. not aware. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm. I'm. I don't know. We it hasn't been a decision on our part that. And so yeah. our decision was to keep it yeah. as an option for people. So maybe it was an so, elimination. Could have been an oversight. And that's fine. So, I, so I don't sure know. It's not like a permanent. Yeah, I, as far as I know. So as okay. far, it's a good question. And as far as I know, that was not a um, okay. purposeful act. Um, and we would try to make it remedy it for hey. the future. I just want to, just for the sake of the presenter's time, I think that this is something people will have questions for, and many people do go back and watch the meetings. Mm -hmm. I feel like it might be in the best interest to have a recording available to put up. Is that a possibility to coordinate? It's I, on YouTube right now, it's, if it's, anybody okay. wants to. Okay, it's, it's yeah. still in the city, yeah. mm -hmm. and will be recorded there. We just don't have the call in. Yes. Right. Right. Thank right. you. Thank you, Carrie, for bringing that up. <laughs> okay. I would like to introduce Karen Kennard, our city manager, and she is going to talk to us about the community campus. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, Karen. Thank you for having me and my colleagues. Uh, joining me tonight are uh, Public Works Director Peter Rice and Recreation Director Todd Henley. And uh, we will be walking you through a brief presentation on the acquisition of community campus and the many benefits to the city as a whole. And I did that correctly, goodness. So um, a brief bit of history, uh, back in May of 2021, the city, and um, by city I say um, it was never a, a, a solo effort, it was always a collaborative effort that included the three of us along with the former superintendent and, and, and many times, if not every time, um, the wonderful business administrator, Nathan Lunny. We uh, approached the Foundation for Seacoast Health, then the owner of the community campus property, to be considered we were very active, uh, uh, actively engaged in a conversation to acquire the property. And from the very start and throughout the evaluation period, it was clear that it was a citywide, all hands on deck effort. It wasn't one parochial interest over another. And even previous to the, the city stepping up to the plate and, and actively pursuing this, um, I, I would, it would be very fair to say that the school department in and of itself was interested in pursuing uh, the potential use of the community campus for at least the Lister Academy, if not other programs. 
and we 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 understand why the Foundation for Seacoast Health chose the city to um, to, to to undertake this acquisition with is 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 in the in their words back in the press release in September um, that we would ensure the legacy of the nonprofits and their accessibility to the community. We shared and continue to share a similar mission and vision, and we pledge to keep the current tenants and consider future like tenants for the building and for which there's lots of excitement and synergy uh, not only among the folks in the building but the folks we intend to move to the building and that would include uh, recreational opportunities educational opportunities even other departments of the city the library is is one that's raised their hand and said please can we can we be involved and i believe um, former superintendent zadovic talked also about after school opportunities and potentially some cte uh, pro programs as well so fast forward to march of this year we formally acquired the building. We moved in. We realized, holy cow, we now own a really large building and 34 <laughs> acres around it. And um, as such, it's been a massive undertaking that, um, that from which none of us have really shied away. All the current leases in the building have been reassigned to the city. We, they all end at the same time, which is the end of calendar year 2024. And uh, Todd Henley will speak to the current use and the, and the folks in the building. But I'm going to here to just give you a sense of context, and then I'll turn it over to Todd. Um, now that the building is formally under our control, we are studying the feasibility and the efficiency of all the space that's there, who's there, is, is the space that they're in, does it make sense for their needs. We're excited at the prospect of the Lister Academy relocating to the former family's first wing of the building, if you can picture that. That's about 12,000 square feet, plus or minus. There are many synergies in addition to the ones I mentioned, the opportunity for the Lister Academy uh, to use among the other tenants uh, the the ball fields the trails around the property there'll be um, transportation to and from the building uh, the greenhouse the sugar shack all of those things um, and what's led us to wanting to be on your agenda this evening is a recent vote of the City Council at their June 21st meeting uh, which called for us to undertake a feasibility study of po potential and possible and realistic future uses of the Sherburn School understanding that Lister Academy was in play to, to relocate. So, um, so with that, Todd will walk you briefly through current uses. Peter will share with you our, our plan for operating and maintaining the facility and the grounds. And then why we're here is, um, and, and thank you for having them on as agenda items, we would look for the school board to acknowledge the relocation of the Lister Academy to the community campus. And when that relocation is complete, to acknowledge that the Sherburn School is no longer needed for educational purposes. So um, I know you know much of that, but I'm excited to share with you my, my teammates and what they know. So I'll ask Todd Henley to come up now. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Are you good? Hi, Todd. Good evening. Uh, my name is Todd Henley. I'm the Recreation Director. So um, just to give you a little overview of what's happening currently at the campus. Um, if you're familiar with the building, um, our department has taken over the former New Heights area of the campus. Um, I moved all of our main offices there, um, so it currently houses uh, my office, our office manager, and also the uh, assistant director's office. Um, along with that, there's also a dedicated pro programming space that we now have uh, where we offer pre-K youth adult um, classes and leagues. Um, it's also home to special events and meeting space as well. Um, and actually, as Karen mentioned, uh, with after school programming, uh, we actually have put in after school programs um, that happen in the spring and they're scheduled for the fall as well um, to you know, help uh, different parents to um, have different options for after school uh, programming. Um, also, we are there to support the local nonprofits that are in the building, which include uh, Seacoast Community School, the Crumple Center, Seacoast Outright, Child Advocacy Center of Rockingham County, and the Portsmouth Adult Education. So next, I'm just going to show you a couple quick photos here. So that's the uh, main entrance of the building. And also, let me just point out, if, if anyone has not been to the building, uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to give tours of the building. I do it all the time. Happy to show up the space. Um, but that is the main entrance. Um, this is the uh, the wing of which uh, Lister would be um, located on the bottom floor there. And there is a dedicated uh, entrance uh, all the way to the right there that would be a, a secure entrance for the school. Um, next up, 
This is uh, the grass field, which is located behind the tennis courts and basketball courts. Just a multi-use field. This is the cafe area. This is uh, obviously the gymnasium and also the stage area. And finally, this is the greenhouse um, area behind the building. And also, if you look to the, to the right of the greenhouses, um, multiple agencies also use um, the, the back space that, uh, out there for uh, raised bed gardens for their programs as well. So I will turn this now over to Peter Rice. Thank you, Todd. Good evening. Uh, Peter Rice, Director of Public Works. Um, as you may know, uh, the Department of Public Works is responsible for the maintenance of city facilities. And with the acquisition of the community campus, uh, we took on the role of, of maintaining this facility along with the uh, trails and parking lots and other uh, assets and um, amenities to the facility. Um, the, the facilities uh, include uh, areas that are common and then the areas that the tenants uh, occupy. The tenants are, are responsible for their own custodial services. Uh, so in this case, we were anticipating that the school would have their own custodial folks in there in that section that the Lister Academy would be. But in the common areas, we would be responsible uh, for the maintenance. Uh, there is a uh, contracted custodial service that would be available if the school found that more cost effective than hiring additional staff or having uh, spreading their staff uh, around. Uh, so that is an option that um, we would work closely with Nathan and, um, and his staff on. Um, the scheduling of common areas uh, is coordinated with the recreation department along with the fields and outdoor spaces. This is similar to our collaborative work already undertaken at the, at the Connie Bean Center. Um, so there's a, a, a track record and a history of our ability to coordinate with, uh, with, with the school. And we have a close relationship uh, with, uh, with your staff. So uh, with that, uh, very brief description of our facilities operations. When we were at that slide of the gym, I, I leaned over to Todd and was reminded that uh, we have a current agreement with the high school to use the gym at community campus while the high school gym is being renovated. And I wanted to tell you one other thing. Um, when we had our grand opening, one of the tenants, it was back in June, and one of the tenants, I believe it was um, Rockingham Community Action uh, or Child Advocacy folks, um, she thanked the city because she noticed, and so did the other tenants, they noticed an immediate improvement in the upkeep of the building, both inside and out. And to be fair, the foundation um, did many things very well, but they, land, being a landlord may, may not have been one of their first priorities. And I can assure you that as the, the new uh, owner and operator of the facility, that is a top of mind for us. So it was nice to hear that recognized, and, and that would be our goal to maintain that kind of level of um, service to, to the tenants, of which we would be some. So. Uh, we've, we've gone over the proposed action tonight. We're now we're here just to answer any questions and to thank you for the consideration. Thank you, Karen, Todd, and Peter. Um, Nathan, did you want to say something or? Okay. Well, why don't we open it up to board members? Do we have any board members that have any questions? Any? Kerry. Just, uh, you know, I know that this is been such a rush thing and thank you for all of this I it's an amazing resource my off my old office was in that picture so I have some sentimental I'm so glad it's staying as a facility um, as intended to support nonprofits and good work I'm just curious about the um, uh, about sort of the timeline the next steps and um, we've had transition with Zach coming in and all of that just Kind of, if you could walk us through what's going to happen from here with Lister, what families of Lister kids can expect, things like that. So, Nathan, I might lean on you a little bit on this one in terms of um, some of the timeline on, on specifically Lister. Um, I'll, I'll just the, the quick version I'll give you from. from I, I had the opportunity. I got the tour, so the tour was great, um, and. Uh, the short version, and you appreciate this, having been in that facility. If you go from where Lister is now to this other facility, it's you know what we're going to be able to offer students is it's you know it's remarkable mm -hmm. what we're going to be able to do. Um, in terms of the timeline, I think the sh short version what I that I can I can take it as far as there was the conversation of January uh, at one point. You know that's not realistic, uh, and um, and now we're in 
we're having some conversations about what is a realistic timeline for Lister with the goal with the I think the initial conversation where the board has let last been I think this is my impression was the possibility of next fall um, but I you know I'm always conservative in the way in which I approach these things and I would say that even I think next fall we have several more things to determine um, including um, some fit up conversations about that space because as it is currently designed is not you know is not designed to, to do some of the classroom work so um, we don't we don't have all those answers yet is the honest answer we were over there with with Kenny um, exploring the space and talking about what we think we need to do but I think what's important to know is that we are you know we're not you know where we're at this point is we're not ready to move into a finished space we've got some work to do before that would be ready so I don't know if Nathan if we want to add anything I, I think I would I would make two comments one I would tell you that the the city took the initiative uh, uh, this this spring after securing and, and having access to the space to engage uh, the services of an architect that actually was involved in the initial design did the initial design of the building and so has all the benefit of knowing what what the building is and how it's been used and the, the synergies that already have existed uh, and and that team met with uh, the folks at Lister the staff the Nancy Roy the principal uh, they worked multiple meetings to establish what what they anticipate the space needs to be uh, for that for that space and then um, conceptualized uh, a fit out just to make sure that what they think they need so you have a science teacher and a math teacher you, know, you need classrooms what they need can fit in the space that we've identified um, for Lister Academy that's really the extent of the work that's been done right now is to say yeah what you need can be made to fit in that space uh, I think that the second comment I would make is that I believe that the conversation tonight and the action that's being asked of you specifically does not include dates. Mm -hmm. It's right. really, it's really that this board has yet to be, uh, may I say that formally, formally in, in a position or has not formally stated that we intend to move, and I think the city's looking for that now. So there's no dates included. We certainly have the opportunity to do this and do this right, um, but. But it was important for us now to come on the record that we agree with everything that's been said publicly for a long time now that we are excited to have Lister have the opportunity to move there. Hope. So I, I just wanted to say thank you first. I know this has been a long and twisty road, and I appreciate the city working with us to come to this conclusion. I think that's great opportunities out there, and I think there's great space to continue to collaborate from a recreational standpoint. And so I appreciate, Todd, that you continue to extend that invitation to the schools. Um, I, I have a few questions. Um, I'll try to combine them. One around tenant contracts, I'm just curious how long the, the current tenants are contracted to be there and do we see any overturn coming in and if so, when and what the stipulations will be for filling new contracts. Secondly, because I know you're good at remembering questions, so I'll throw them at you. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know how many you got, but I'll around the <laughs> around the cost, um, do we have an idea when we have when we have numbers for cost um, for the fitting of of uh, Lister Academy and how those will be absorbed? Just I know we've had conversations about it, but I'm not sure exactly where it landed, and I just want to know for the public to be able to hear where that has landed. Um, and then I do have concern about the, the dire needs of the Sherburn building for another year and how we're gonna be addressing maybe some of their needs. Mm -hmm. I'll take the tenant question and I'll punt on the second question to either Peter or um, Nathan. But uh, all of the current tenant contracts run through the calendar year of 24. Okay. And uh, we were happy to assume and, and, and have assigned to us the existing contracts. It's our intention to renew with all the existing tenants should they wish to stay. Okay. I think what remains to be seen is, is there space for other tenancies, whether they be city uses or other, and that's part of our due diligence, um, but that would not speak to the space that would be set aside for Lister. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I guess, I, I'm not sure that I can, I'm not sure that I can, Peter might be able to help me guess guesstimate when we might be able to assign some level of cost to it. We are, it is clear to us that there will be cost. Uh, you know that we had a lengthy conversation for some number of weeks or months about uh, dollars that we might invest previously in the purchase or you know, acquisition of the, of the space. In our last iteration, 
uh, we looked at some of the extra dollars that we might allocate to doing some of that fit out. Uh, my humble opinion walking it is that the costs may certainly look greater than what we had set aside in that and we were gonna we're gonna have to be creative to try to come up with other ways that we might secure financing and make that happen part of that weighs on the conversation about when can we finish this project and make the move happen and so we'll be exploring that um, coming out of the visit that we had most recently we started to bang our heads back and forth about what are our options and and uh, is there a shell game that can be made to work within the timelines that we have certain funding available to us? So we don't have any answers right now. How quickly that that space needs assessment turns into uh, estimated dollars? Can you can you guesstimate that for me if you want? <laughs> I mean, it, it could come together relatively quickly. But when you do facilities planning, there's a uh, what they call a um, contingency, which mm -hmm. is is a much higher number than when you get down into refined detail of, of a design. Yes. Uh, but we could probably turn something around, I would think, within a month um, to, to get at least a, you know, that initial level of, of planning number. Um, the, the potential, um, you know, having the fit out and, and conceptual layout already done uh, really goes a long way uh, to, to be able to accomplish that. So I think having, you know, a, a clear direction from you all was, was really where we were waiting. And once we have that, we'll be able to come back and. Um, you know, we, obviously Nathan and I work closely together on a lot of stuff, uh, and we would continue to work closely uh, on this project. And then just regarding the needs of Sherburne, uh, um, like with heat and other things for this year, do we have the dollars to address any of their needs? Um, where do those that? I'll wait for Mr. Lynchy to text me because normally this time <laughs> this, is when, this is when the phone buzzes with an answer. In the middle of a football game. I, I guess I'm going to tell you that um, uh, our our operating budget has uh, project maintenance project dollars, which are uh, some of it targeted and some of it contingency, anticipating in each of our buildings the work that will have to be done to make repairs and um, and upgrades as things uh, as things falter you know, like they do during a year. So there are dollars that are allocated there for the work at Sherburn, but let me step back and clarify that those budgeted dollars are no different this year than they have been in recent years, mm -hmm. which are a Band-Aid level of budgeting, really just to make sure that the place is continued to made sa make safe, uh, yeah, it's continued to be made safe so that we can have students and staff there regularly. Um, so that's, it's the continuing. The boiler plant is still working, so there continues to be heat. Right now, there's, I don't believe anything <laughs> leaking through the ceiling, but it's, you know, I, I'm not gonna celebrate the facility uh, at this point otherwise, but we do expect that it, it can be kept safe for staff and students <laughs> for another cycle. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Liz. Uh, two, two separate questions. Uh, first question, my biggest concern with the community campus and Lister Academy being there was uh, exposure to the children to the outside um, as far as security goes. And so I was curious if there has been any more thought put into this, uh, particularly, um, I could be totally off on this, but my understanding was that um, uh, Families First may have transitioned to another location so that they can offer more services to people, a wider demographic of people, including, including people with criminal, rec you know, criminal backgrounds. Um, given that the, the Portsmouth Rec Department's using it, I don't know, um, you know, is there, are we now, op if the Portsmouth Rec Department's opening it, the city owns it, are we now opening it up to the wider, broader community and therefore um, the children, I guess I'm just wondering what, what kind of barriers or parameters, I mean, obviously I want the kids to be able to use the whole space if they're able to, um, but I'm a little bit concerned with that sort of uh, protection piece that we have in other schools where our other schools are sort of blocked off. And I mean, I, I know there's probably parts of this that maybe the police need to get into and probably can't be discussed publicly, but I guess I just wanted to understand that a little bit and, and also maybe understand if, there's, if there are barriers. Are there barriers right now that need to be addressed? So I, I, let me start with a piece of that and say that the family's first space that we expect that Lister Academy would occupy is on the basement, oh, not basement, it's on the lower level. It's a, it's a, it was in the picture that <laughs> Todd showed you. Uh, and that lower level by the simple fit out that's been identified right now would be a secured space. So we would have an airlocked entrance that is pre-existing there where our traffic would come in, go from the building. The other end of our space, if you will, would be, I believe that in our design, we contemplated that it would be lockable in both directions really, so that it would not be, 
it, it doesn't have to serve as a fire exit so that it can be locked from within so that we're not, we're not a, a, exiting into the building without some intention, but also locked and secure so that nobody from the rest of the building is, is entering the space. Having said that, there's a common space gymnasium upstairs and other areas on the campus that we expect that students would use, uh, but as a, as a school, the expectation was that we would have a locked exterior. And so by design, we think we would. I'll stop there. Uh, the, the yeah, and I guess to ask a clarifying question would be to the, to the city, essentially, and maybe this is a legal question that needs to be answered. Are we allowing sex offenders and folks with criminal records to come onto the community campus, given that there's the Portsmouth Rec Department and it's now a city-owned space? I don't know if, you know, can we still block those type of folks from entering um, facilities and, and um, it provides for the, I don't know if you could, maybe that could be like a follow up if somebody can answer for me at a later date. I guess that would be sort of my concern there. I feel like I have context that might be helpful. <laughs> do you, yeah. Harry, do you want to address that? If you don't mind. Yeah. What I think would get to the heart of your question in the form of an answer would be the legal department's uh, understanding of accessibility of municipal buildings. Um, but Todd can speak briefly to the security measures that we've taken up since March. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when the city took the building over, <clears throat> um, we've instituted a couple of different things. One, there was already a security uh, camera system in the entire building, so we kept that. That's all still uh, working. Um, one of the major things, though, was uh, there were five different outside entrances to enter the building. Um, and and had been that way for quite a while. Um, we now all, all f f except for one, we only have the main entrance, with the, picture I sh the first picture I showed you. Um, that is now the only entrance to enter and exit the building. Um, we now have staff that are at the front reception area as soon as you walk in, uh, and they, they are there from pretty much the time the building's open until the time that we close. Um, and so, you know, there is, you know, they become the first point of contact um, for anyone that comes into the building. Um, and also there are uh, panic buttons throughout the building to all the different agencies and, and tenants and stuff. So, uh, in fact, actually just about, I guess it was maybe last month, um, I had a full walkthrough with Rochelle Jones and some of the tenants as part of an overview of all of the, of the security for the building. And it's part of the, um, w we have tenant meetings um, that will be coming up and that will be addressed you know, from time to time just to make sure everyone's on the same page with all that. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, my last question uh, also to you, Todd, too. Um, you had mentioned after school programs. There's talk of after school programs. Obviously, school starts in three weeks. Um, the big issue that we had last year was everybody's back to work, everybody's back in the office, and what do we have for full time? Uh, programs. Um, we the programs at each school. My understanding, at least for Dondera, Don was peak was completely full. Um, and I, I assume this year is probably going to be no different. Um, we ha offer Gundalo. I mean, Gundalo has a program with YMCA in Greenland that uh, we had been busing to. You're talking about busing to your. Um, possible after school programs, are you talking a full time program or are you talking, um, you know, one day a week for a certain time? And I guess my concern would be is if we're having busing issues, I'd prefer busing, you know, it's great to have these activities, but I prefer that we focus busing in on the full time, you know, employment situation um, given everybody's demographic right now with COVID and inflation and whatnot. Uh, so uh, my long term vision. For that building is yes to the rec for the recreation department to um, work together possibly with the Seacoast Community School. We've already actually had these talks already um, to offer a citywide um, after-school program. Um, however, w with the city just acquiring the building, you know, in, in March, it, that wasn't able to happen for this fall. Um, so it's something on our radar. It's something that I, I really want to see happen. It's one of the biggest things that when we were talking about acquiring the building, that I, I you know I pitched the city about how it was going to help the recreation department. Um, so, you know, as a parent and someone who actually goes to the peak program, um, you know, I, I do recognize and I've spoken to a lot of the principals and uh, we, we do recognize as a city that we need more after school help full time. Um, however, in the meantime, uh, we, we have set up um, you know, our fall programming guide is going to be out mm, like the end of August. And I'm thinking off the top of my head, I want to say we have stuff at least four days a week uh, after school there. Um, and I, I worked with Nathan last uh, spring to be able to get transportation there um, to uh, three different programs that we had and went off without a hitch, um, at least I hope. 
Uh, and um, <laughs> and so we're, we're hoping to try to get that back this fall and make sure that, um, you know, that we can offer that. And I, a lot of the programs that I'm working with, it was, everyone's really excited, you know, about being able to offer that. And the New Hampshire Theater Project is a good example of, we were doing, partnering with them on classes at their theater and but they are really excited that they're like oh no if we can get kids there and they're you know like we're, we're gonna you know this program's gonna flourish we're gonna be able to do all these different things so uh, we're you know so I guess I you know this is our short-term solution but long term I definitely would like to see uh, more full-time child this care there K through 12 uh, th for the programs now or all together what the plan for busing over there would it be K through 12 or middle school focus I know New Heights obviously focus on middle school and we're yeah I, you know that's too. probably more future planning to see what we'd have to do but um, you know I, I would love to hit the you know teenage middle school area definitely so okay before we get to Lisa and Ann Zach would like to so I just want to say I appreciate that we're um, I just wanted to let the board know we were, we were just having this dialogue um, within the last two days and so we've got uh, multiple transportation things we're trying to work through at the moment um, and so that includes some conversation about some concerns about our, our existing bus routes inside of the district uh, we're also in the midst of conversations with both Gundalo and with rack about what is also possible come the fall so we're in a really short time frame and we've got things to print and put out uh, and we don't have all those answers yet. I know we have some meetings coming up this week. We're trying to resolve some of those issues. Uh, so uh, I would just say stay tuned. Um, for now, we're working on it. I think our goal is to, is of course, to have our own internal um, normal K-12 operation function the way it's supposed to, and then simultaneously provide as much um, as you know as much access to opportunities to as many families uh, as we can. But we're still trying to work with the buses we have, the money we've got. And, um, and trying to partner with as many of these um, other entities as we can. And is the rec department no longer at the middle school and do we need to fill that space? I know kids used to go to the rec department ball, you know, play ball after school or whatever and the rec would cover that versus the middle school. Do we need to sort of take that? Nope, Connie Bean Center is still the Connie Bean Center. Um, okay. we, it's just that, that will be available for, um, you know, uh, sports programming and, uh, and after school open gym. Uh, but this is just the campus is just an additional space for us now. Okay, great. Thank you. Lisa. I have a super simplistic question. I just want to make sure I understand. Our goal here is just to vote on the Lister move. I'm assuming we'll have an opportunity down the line to have some more conversations about some of the details in terms of what programming for the school is going to happen in that space, right. correct? Yes. So we don't That's need right. to solve all right. that right at this right. moment. And I think it was important <laughs> what uh, Nathan mentioned, which is, again, this, these motions don't include a timeline. So depending on what we need to do in terms of fit up and, and um, um, what types of dollars we access will have an impact on what type, what, what windows we have in terms of the ability to contract to do some of that work, all those things are, are up in the air. But what we want to make sure is that the city is in a position mm -hmm. To formally hear from us that we are ready to move in this direction we have details to work out on our end in, ter in terms of some of the programming when that program will be ready to go but it's yes it's twofold yes we are going to move we want to become a tenant effectively uh and yes we are um we're ready to turn um the sherburn school back over to the city for other purposes i would be prepared to make motions but i don't want to yeah we, we have them on the agenda right yeah okay. Okay, Ann, did you well, want Well, my question was, I, I had been through the tour with the Lister Academy staff, and so I, I kind of have an idea of what they were hoping for. That was before the architect was involved. But I, I wondered how soon uh, they would start working on that. I, I realize that the immediate issue is more important. Well, and I, so I think your, your motions, to, your actions tonight certainly helped the council, uh, you know, begin to have its conversation about what might come next. Uh, and because we really hadn't formally said anything, I think this is really an important step tonight. We did have a great tour. I was with you that day. Yes. I, I will tell you that with all the transition that we've had, what really needs to happen next is that we reassemble the, the Lister Academy staff with their new director yep. and dig deeper into the work that's already been done by the architect to make sure that we give feedback before we start talking about how we would really do it and what it would really cost. Uh, the, the work looks like it does speak very specifically to what the staff had asked for. I think that was the idea. Ultimately, I think they're a, they're a new team with new leadership, 
and we, we want to actually massage that a bit and make sure that it's going to work um, for the near term and the longer term. So that'll come next, but I expect that that will happen as we get school open and the staff make, you know, the staff are back, we'll be, we'll be doing that. So right. in the next, next month or two. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Okay. Um, if anyone would like to make a motion that we move um, item 10A and 10B up so that we can vote on this now since we're talking about it. Do we have a motion to do that? Motion to move 10A and 10B up. Second. Okay. So the motion on the floor is consideration and approval to move to relocate the Lister Academy program from Sherburn School to the former community campus building upon completion of necessary renovations to accommodate the program. Move to approve. Second. Do we have a second? Lisa? Second Lisa. All in favor, our discussion. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the second motion, consideration and approval pursuant to RSA 199-411 to transfer care and control of the Sherbin School to the City of Portsmouth by the Portsmouth School <coughs> Department upon relocation of the Lister Academy program to the former community campus. Move to approve. A uh, quick discussion, sorry, just to throw this in there. Is there a way that the school board could uh, become, be apprised of everything that's going on? I mean, it seems like the rec department was able to get over there pretty quickly. So let's say halfway through the year, we could get Lister Academy over there or something worked out. Like, <laughs> could we, you know, be part of that understanding of the process? I know you don't want to rush it and, and you know, I, no, sort of. I think, <laughs> we're I mean, we're, we're talking about a whole, moving a whole school with students and staff to a location. We, you guys are going to be in the loop as to what what we're doing with that but I, I i just to be clear there is no situation in which we're moving in january okay. that's definite uh and um so uh but as as things evolve and as we will we'll keep you in the loop i guess or even to use the space like if they're able to transport over there use the space if it comes available i don't know i just i think it's such a great space and i think that we're you know there's areas lacking at lister and so if the rec department's able to take advantage i'd like to see us be able to take advantage sooner than later all right, thanks. Um, any other comments? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Karen, you, Peter, guys. Todd, thank, thank you, you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Another collaboration between the city and the schools. Thank you. <laughs> Said like a good former city councilor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next on the agenda, we have the superintendent's report. So you, you, you have a variety of um, materials uh, in the packet already. I will say that I also hand carried uh, for you. Um, you have a stapled copy of um, summer programming. There was a request uh, back at our first meeting in July, just kind of about what was going on in relation to summer programming. Uh, this is a, uh, I will not accept uh, uh, you know, credit for authorship. Uh, this is a compilation of, of things that were provided to me. Uh, but uh, the things that I asked people to speak to, I felt were the were what was being uh, requested, which is basically what is the programming at those at particular um, connected with particular uh, levels or um, departments. Uh, what were the number of students that were involved uh, in those programs, and how were those students selected to to participate in those programs? Uh, so you have a variety of different staff members who contributed um, the information the information that you have. Um, needless to say, there's a lot of different opportunities um, that target different types of students. Sometimes that's uh, connected to um, socioeconomic status. Sometimes that is connected to academic need. Um, but it, it depends on the program and the funding source. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zach. I think you have more, though. I do. So uh, a couple of <laughs> other uh, things just around school opening that are just kind of quick, quick ones. Uh, I had a meeting today, and, and so we weren't able to include anything in the packet. Uh, Karen Utgard, who's the now, I think, you'll I think you'll remember that Chris Burke had served as someone who was overseeing our nurses as, as part, well, not part, but she was wellness quarter, coordinator. And I think as we moved into COVID, she took over some responsibilities to help out the nursing staff. That has now moved to Karen, um, who is the, the uh, nurse at uh, New Franklin. Uh, Karen and I had an opportunity to sit down today, talk about 
uh, what adjustments, if any, were coming in for our COVID um, policies and procedures uh, coming eight down from uh, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, <laughs> nurses were told, point people around the state were told, I think it was yesterday or today, that there will be no, they don't anticipate any changes coming um, <coughs> prior to the start of the school year. Now, that is all subject to what happens, right? Um, <laughs> but at the moment, that's what we're, we're building towards is that for, and it's important for our staff and our parents to understand that we would basically be in a status quo for where we were in the spring. Uh, and um, and we'll, do, we'll be doing some um, communication on that. Uh, Sharon and her group are working on some documents for me and we anticipate probably about the week before school would start, we would push that out uh, on a variety of different platforms to just remind people we're in the same situation as we were when we left. So that's where we're at uh, in relation to that. Um, I'll, I'll mention one that's an older one, just to repeat. Um, I do anticipate at one of the, or probably in one of the September meetings, we'll do, we'll do some group of us will talk a, a little bit about uh, emergency plans within the district um, and uh, some of the, the uh, security issues. I'm in the process of going through my review of those things and then hope to be meeting before that, before I come back to you, meeting with, um, with the PD around some of the work that they've done uh, and um, have some folks present to you kind of a review of where we're at. Um, what are the things um, that could, uh, you know, where are we strong and where, what are some things that we intend to work on? So that is coming. I anticipate that would be in um, September. The other one I want to mention is I, this was something that um, it's the beauty of this time of year. July was great, really calm, lots of people on vacation, uh, nothing happening. You get into August and then stuff starts popping. So uh, yesterday I received a uh, email from the city clerk uh, to let me know uh, to in to reach out because on September 13th is the primary. Uh, and um, when she checked out our calendar, she said, hey, you look like you're in school. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that, uh, that uh, for a variety of reasons around security, uh, that uh, the board in the past and the superintendent's office has moved to close schools where voting was gonna take place. And I believe that's what the three elementaries and uh, Portsmouth Middle School, the high school is not affected. Uh, so, um, I took that information and said, okay, great, we're only a couple weeks away from that having an impact on people. Uh, and, uh, and then sat down today, had a, we had a meeting with principals around a variety of issues. One of the, and in that, you know, brought this to their attention and said, well, talk to me about what, you know, what you think about this. And to a person, they were like, yeah, but we don't have a choice. You, you have to, you can't be open on those days. So um, I have not yet had an opportunity because this is all happening pretty fast to engage uh, our um, our various unions to uh, talk about any pot potential impact on the on the contracts and how we could structure something that would fit within the contracts and simultaneously make sure that we are not open in those buildings um, for that day. So I don't have a solution for you yet uh, that is coming soon, um, but I would appreciate because we don't have another uh, board meeting until. Uh, that night, actually, yeah, right? Say. <laughs> Are we gonna need to move that too? I, um, what's that? Uh, I guess my question to that would be, we're scheduled to be in chambers that night. I don't know how primary goes as far as the city collecting data, if they use this location no, at all. They don't. No, they don't. primary, no. They don't. So, um, so, I mean, but it is somebody's birthday in there, right? Yeah, That's it's what I heard. somebody's birthday. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, um, so anyways, I, what I would appreciate, because we're in the awkward situation of not being, probably not reconvening prior to that time, and very often a, a calendar decision would be a board uh, decision, uh, if you have the ability to empower me within the, to make an adjustment that one, um, aligns with your, what has been your practice to not have those buildings open uh, due to security concerns, uh, and um, that I would do it in consultation with, with our associations and make sure it was communicated properly to parents. I would, I would greatly appreciate it, which save you from having a special meeting to come back to consider it. And for the record, can you just state which buildings those are for those that might be new to our community? So I, th I believe, yeah, so I believe, <laughs> so as somebody who's new to the community, I'll say I believe that is uh, each of the three elementary schools and then Portsmouth Middle School. School. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like a motion for that or? I think that would be good um, if, if you would be willing to do that, yes. 
Mago. I would like to make a motion to um, provide the superintendent with the power to <laughs> alter the school calendar to reflect the no school being held at our elementary schools in Portsmouth Middle School on election day in the absence of a board meeting. And the elementary middle Did school and that? elementary yes. school. Okay. okay. Second. And second, my go first and second. All in favor? Discussion, real quick. Oh, and discussion. Yeah, I'm just a little bit concerned. I mean, I, I for, as a, from a working parent standpoint, yep. you know, I was trying to push for the first day of school to start on the 29th instead of the yep. 30th because of school contracts for whatever reason, or you know, just generally. So we start on Tuesday. So and then there's no school yep. Friday, and then there's no school Monday, and then so then. So we're so that first week of school we're missing two days, the second week of school a day, and then the third week of school a day. And I guess I'm just concerned about coverage and communicating mm -hmm. with after school programs to be able to have those days open. I mean, obviously I understand that there's this this piece here, but I'm just a little bit concerned with you know three weeks out, and I'm not sure that we have all the after school programs lined up and all this. I obviously, don't want to throw it all on your plate, but I don't want to be. That's the job. In it. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I, so, I, so I would say I, I had the same concerns. So when I originally had the reach out from the, yeah. from, the um, from the city, it was like, ooh, we are really close. And um, you know, as people try to learn line up work schedules and we and um, you know, after school uh, care situations and whatnot, I haven't had any of those dialogues yet, and this is on me. So I will say, you know, what was clear to me in both conversations on the municipal side and. Uh, within the school system was you know the fact that people can open carry during voting yeah yeah it's yeah. like it's it was like and it's like okay that pretty much yeah. ends that conversation no so now i got to go figure out the the other part unfortunately mm -hmm. so i was i was very much in that in that same spot and i i want to do everything i can to try to mm -hmm. solve those issues but the yeah the um the potential for weapons in our buildings you know yeah, I guess over, I just I guess I just wanted to say that out loud just to sort of say, you know, is it if if these after school programs cannot pick up the slack in covering that day or any of the days, I don't know if we can get creative to offer after, you know, some sort of programming for kids that don't have a place to go. Would be sort yep, of and my, I, uh, I I will explore what's here. possible. What's hard for me is in a yeah, I don't know within our existing staffing patterns, our existing collective bargaining agreements, what will or will not be possible. Like I said, I don't have a solution tonight, no. um, but I, we would work to do what we can to try to alleviate as much of that strain as we can. All right. um, because the window is so short, we'll see what we're able to do. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that kind yeah. of oh, Carrie. Um, just as, uh, just specifics, um, re uh, similar concern to Liz with school coverage. Um, you know, YMCA, peak community, and also maybe RAC, like just giving even a heads up for that because um, all of those have covered school out days um, yep. in the past and just making sure they have time too. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Yep. Okay. Anyone that. else? Hope. So my concern is around communication because that sure. word comes up a lot yes. in this district and yes. the lack of yes. uh, enough notice. So. I understand you don't have a date tonight or a solution, yeah. but when can you expect to get communication out to people once you have, and where should they be looking for so that? So we, we had a conversation, um, that con I think we mentioned some of this at the retreat the other night, the that sometimes putting out partial information mm -hmm. before you have perfect information is, is the way to go. So so I'd anticipate in the next couple, of, within the next 48 hours or so, once I have my initial quick dialogues with folks, even if I don't have the perfect solutions yet, I'll be announcing to parents that this was, you know, this is something that uh, that was we need to correct. Um, and then we're trying to work with partners to find solutions, but we need you to be aware right now that as of now, we know this would, you know, we know the schools would be closed and we're working on what else would, would happen. But here's that information, so. Okay. Any other, um, Ian? I just wanted to mention for Zach that parents will be both, they'll be very understanding because when we have our regular election in November, yeah. that we always have parent conference day so that there are no children in the school. So right. they were aware of that. So I they, think Anne just offered to take my kid for the day. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to clarify, when we say the schools will be closed, the buildings will be closed, but is remote an all, option? Is that on the table? All TBA. So, uh, okay. So okay. Uh, I just point, want to clarify yeah. that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nick. Nick. Would, Nick. No day. 
would remote be possible? Because isn't there a state law that says you can't do remote unless it's a snow day? Mm -hmm. or and have it count or would that not Our be that was a Sununu proclamation last year yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. proclamation. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I like I, I like on August 9th dealing with snow day like scenarios uh, so uh, so I don't know the answer to your question but it's a good it's a good inquiry and I'll, I'll see what I can find out anyone else all in favor of the motion aye, aye. any opposed motion passes Okay, thank you, Zach. Thank you. In, are you finished? Did yeah, you talk I'm, about the, I the letter? I mean, the letter. The, I mean, the Evaldi I, letter. I think we put the letter back in because I think we referenced it at a previous meeting around uh, safety concerns. So I think there was a desire to include the letter again just as a refresher for people um, around the statement from the city and the schools. Okay. And it shows the cooperation we have with our police department, I think, which um, oh, yeah. we're, we're fortunate to have that. Many communities don't. So. Okay, on to old business. Our second board retreat is August 22nd from 5 to 8 in the school board conference I'm room. sorry, I, I had a question for the super, after the superintendent's oh, report. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe just, uh, I just wanted to comment and just say thank you for this um, summer programming. And I honestly like think this would be great to just to continue to use year after year to sort of now you already have a model of what we do, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so this is great. And then so my, uh, my question, though, was... Um, you had mentioned that DHHS and COVID policies, things were going to stay the same. Was there any clarification about this bit? And I don't know if you need to get back to me as far as um, because we had received feedback about it. But towards the end of last year, there was an email that came out. I don't know that the board was ever really flagged to the, the instance of it. But it basically said something like, if you were fully vaccinated, you could return to school. If you weren't fully vaccinated, you had to stay out of school for 10 days or something to that effect per state guidelines or whatever so when you're saying that nothing's changing is that are you saying that that um that is going to still stay in effect or what it, do you know what the what that sort of um guideline might be uh, i don't know around that specific issue but i can definitely inform the, i think that's going to be gonna a, inform everybody in the community but, but i, I think that's going to be a huge question okay all right thank you i mean you. our goal is to be will be to be as specific in what we communicate as possible while not overwhelming people with what we communicate at the same time so um so like i said karen and her crew are working on some documents and then um and i think it, anyways we'll try to be as clear as we possibly can and i'll i'll make sure we're clear about that okay Take thank questions. you okay so the board retreat august 22nd five to eight i think everyone knows about that um we move on to uh, consideration and approval pursuant to RSA. Oh no, we already did that. No, we haven't done. done. Yeah, we did. <laughs> B. Oh, yeah. We did B. We're, We're on, on to C. 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 Um, consideration and approval of policies. The single reading. Yeah. It's uh, respect B C A, respect G B E B E, and respect J I C D. And we have those all in our packets. So. <clears throat> so I what get, I can say from the policy committee is yes, there, we have them for single reading. Um, because the, how it appeared in our policy handbook was it was the same policy in all three sections and the, um, the language didn't match necessarily the um, cohort that the policy was applying towards. So um, the edits that were done, as you can see in the transcript that you were provided with, was to clean up the language so that it was more um, delineated as to who the policy was referring to. You also got from me when we walked into meeting today, and I don't know where I put it, um, it has highlights on it, which were the suggested um, proposed thank you to our new editing process. It has really helped receive thank you, received information um, before we get to the meetings. So the, I highlighted for you some of the language changes that um, we can consider tonight for BCA, GBEBE, and JICDE. In case folks don't know, all of our policies are coded. The letter code um, refers to the group that the policies are referring to. So anything in the B is always referring to the board. Anything in the G is always referring to personnel. And anything in the J are student related policies. So when you see that first proposed change under each one, um, 
there was feedback that it's not always clear if you don't know those codes who the policy is relating to. So when it says respect, they're all code, they're all titled respect. Could we consider saying respect colon school board, respect colon personnel, respect colon students? And then the second um, comments that are in there, and then I'll stay quiet, had to do with the semantics of the way in which that first paragraph read. Ultimately, these policies are to say that we expect respectful behavior from all members that are interacting in our schools, and it clarifies what respectful behavior is. It then would say that under each group, it is that group. We expect students to be respectful to teachers, parents, guardians, community members, et cetera. We expect board members to be respectful to, and we would expect staff members to be respectful to. Um, so that is the first change that you're seeing. And then the second proposed change had to do with the way that we worded, um, not that we, the way that the, wor the wording was done for reporting, the procedure for reporting. The language was a bit vague. Um, and so what you're seeing and the highlighted changes there would be um, in um, like step with the policy BCA under procedure. So um, GBEBE lines 10 and 11 would be changed to say any person who alleges a violation of this policy is asked to immediately report any violation of this policy by an employee to the assistant superintendent or the superintendent. Um, and so on and so forth. You can, I don't need to read them verbatim, but um, so that's that set of policies. There was um, the only thing, as I said, we did was clean up that the language coordinated with the cohort it represented. Okay, do we have any questions, comments? Lisa? One quick comment. I love putting who the policy applies to on the top because I do think if you don't know that alphabet soup of letters, like just as a community member or somebody coming in, it is very hard to know what you're looking at. So I think that's a great thing and I would love you to consider doing that for all of the policies as they come up if that's possible and appropriate because it's great. Um, and I have just a quick question about um, the BCA, the school board one, and it may be a later discussion, but I wondered, first of all, would we want to have any question of um, an issue be reviewed by both the chair and the vice chair, just so there's two people at the table and it potentially could just be like a little bit more, I mean, I don't know, it just sounds a little better to me that way. Um, That's a great idea. And then also, I don't believe that this is referring to ethics violations because that's a separate city issue. So that does not need to be in this policy? That's correct. Okay, thank that you. That was discussed. So are you just, just so I have it clear from my notes. So I'm just asking to say chair and vice under chair. Under line 18. Mm -hmm. I don't have the whole policy in front of me. Okay. I thought I did, yep. but I don't see it. Got it. Because I have too uh, much it, on my um, I think it would be line 17. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. 17. Meeting with the chairperson and vice chair. Yep. Yes. Thank you. If we're formalizing the language and like that, should we have a specific uh, policy for if the chairperson or vice chairperson are the ones in? Uh, yeah, that's in there. Substantiate claims in question. That's in there. That's the last line. But but in the event that but because we need two people at the table, or we're looking to have two people at the table, if if the vice chairperson is um, mm -hmm. meeting with the chairperson, then that's only one person. Great idea. Any suggestions so on who that should be? A random One person. random member. Yeah, I think that would be a good policy. Yeah, yeah. selected at random. Don't know that. Pull from a hat. <laughs> yeah, fine. Look like he likes that. <laughs> That's how we do our ethics committee appointee. Right. Thanks yeah. for the big winner here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's Brian, right? Yeah. right? Is your actual yeah. language yeah. is going to go in there? Yeah. Are we will pull Brian. from a hat? No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. actual language? We're the ethics board. Okay. A representative to the ethics board. Okay. Okay. We'll roll some dice. Okay. And I had the big one. Yeah, right. Did everyone get those two changes on line 17? It's going to say chairperson and vice chairperson. And then on line uh, 18, it will say vice, uh, vice chairperson slash selected, uh, board member selected at random. Excuse me, Morgan. Yes. Um, so just to clarify to Lisa's point that this is responding to respect and not the ethics, our ethics policy is where? 
Can I? Um, can uh, did I, we have wait, one? No, 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 no. She asked Margo to address okay. the question. It's okay. Liz is on the policy committee. She can. Yeah, I was going to. Well, before Lisa had. Uh, I was going to make the comment about the ethics part. I think that was a big part of our conversation and um, the ethics um, uh, guidelines that apply to the school board members are in the city charter. Um, and it's the same or similar, same as it would apply elsewhere. So any sort of any sort of uh, ethics specific violation should be going through that process. This is more respect and um, and so it's a, I'm sorry. I understand. I, yeah. you, you, no need to say more. I, I get it. Thank you. And it okay. actually, it. it brought up the point that I forgot to mention that this co this policy BCA why we have it in front of us does need to be recoded because the school board association BCA is the school board code of ethics uh, or code of norms and so that is not BCA so it will be recoded it'll still be in the B's we have to look at all the other letters to make sure there's not a conflict just know that it will be recoded because there's a conflict of coding but it will begin with a B it will begin with a B Okay, should Lisa, we vote on these? Lisa oh, Lisa. Question. I have one more question, and I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand no, the mechanics. Fine. But we have the board norms. Is there a reason that we're not referencing them in this policy? I think the. I'm to sorry. Be followed. As I think part the, of this. Um, <laughs> well, I think the discussion that we had was basically what are we getting at with this policy and what do we get at with the ethics policy and i think anything that's substantiated or that's like a, a serious concern should be run through the ethics process this is more of a um which it seems like semantics to some extent but um this is more of a um uh, I'm trying to figure out the, for lack of better terms, if you know, a, a conversation about respect, um, uh, you know, if there was really any line crossed, then it would go towards that. I think it's some of the policy and creating policy and limiting the policy and not adding in extra policy is to sort of make it clear that, you know, if somebody felt like there was a, a lack of respect or a, a lack of courteous regard or treatment, I think is the legal term, um, uh, then it would go through this process and the chair would have a meeting. So it, essentially, it wouldn't. This is more a requirement, I believe. Under um, I don't know if it's a requirement under the statute or requirement under um, the the state uh, school board association recommends school it, board association, um, yes. but it may be a, a statutory requirement, and so. Um, I would just hesitate to add, I think the hesitation would be to add more to it in reality. Um, it's, you know, I think it covers um, that piece. Lisa. Was that, I think I let Zach speak first. No, I, I want to speak oh, to I'm your sorry. question. I didn't so, know. We both I, jumped at the same sorry. time. Sorry. <laughs> it's quick though. I think my question is just, I understand what you're saying, Liz, but I believe if there was a specific state statute, it would be referenced in here and I'm not seeing it. And my understanding of the New Hampshire school board policies is they are suggestions that we should certainly consider and understand, but we don't have to follow verbatim. Mm -hmm. And I would like us to consider having our board norms have some sort of force so that if they're not followed there's at least a conversation about it doesn't mean like you know we're being punitive or whatever but I guess like for the student respect policy for the staff respect policy there's some sort of mention of what happens and we don't have that and so I guess I'm curious about even if we just add not to list every single norm and codify it so we have to change it whenever we have different people come on and off, mm -hmm. but Reference just to say names. that there's an expectation that you would follow the norms that are agreed upon by the board, Yep, I guess. So that's I would question. say I think your last, for me, your last point is the most important one, which is yeah. it's the, um, once you codify it, it rolls on beyond yeah, you guys. Yeah, and I don't want to list every single thing. So, so <laughs> I mean, my thing is when I think about norms, and we were, we were just norm, we were norming uh, the other day with principals, mm -hmm. and one of the things we talked about was uh, with a, well, with your paid leadership people, uh, was that every time, if at any year we had one different person join the group, we should really renorm mm -hmm. um, because it's now we're a different group and mm -hmm. we're all gonna, you know, we're all gonna kind of pinball off each other in different ways, um, and we might need different things. And so for me, the norms are more about a agreements between all of you about the way in which you agree, and they're informal agreements about how you agree to operate with one another, um, as opposed to something you would codify. But I hear. I also hear the, the desire, and maybe the city council, they don't call them norms, they have 
uh, rules, and rules and regulations. Rules and regulations. This page is long. So, <laughs> so they have very they have codified like this is how you will behave yourself and here's how mm -hmm. you won't. Um, that wasn't necessarily I think what we were trying to do in the retreat the other night. But that's okay. just my opinion. Hope. So I, I just want to make a comment about that um, for a couple of reasons. One, I think if you look at this respect policy, number one, it's policy. I, I'm in agreement with Zach that when I look at the norms, I think that's more of a procedural agreement between mm -hmm. us and that can change a lot. So it would mean that depending on how we word it, you'd have to change the policy language a lot too. But this policy, if you look at the procedures, is not around how just the board is interacting with one another. It's the board interacting sure. with employees, students, parents, guardians, and members of the public. That is outside of our board norms. And so I don't feel that the board norms that are between the nine of us, procedurally of how we will operate, need to be included in something that's really, when you look at walking through the procedure, anyone who has allegations of violation of this policy to ask to immediately report any violation of this policy by a school board member, I could make a viol violation as a school board member to anyone in our community that could be alleged against me. And then that would be reported to the assistant superintendent or superintendent. So th those are very separate components mm -hmm. of operation, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. Pip. And then Karen. Um, I'm good. I agree oh. with Hope that, that they are um, separate. However, I don't agree that we couldn't list, that we couldn't include just even just the phrase, including the norms established by the board. Um, for interaction within the board or where, where would you put that um, maybe where it says respectful behavior is defined as courteous regard um, I, I'm not actually sure where exactly where I put it yet it says, but maybe where, but it where it towards one another defines what um, what the behaviors are that we're expecting because that way the the board norms could change every year but but I think that respecting the board norms is sort of a key aspect of whether we all respect each other in our interactions. So it does feel like it belongs here in terms of board member behavior. Well, you're right, Pip, that it could possibly uh, be slipped up civil I, I have court. my hand up, I'm sorry. Uh, Carrie was going first. I called on Carrie first. Okay. So I, I hear the discussion in the norming piece, but I, I don't, I think that any member could say that a violation of a norm was part of violation of respect. So I don't I don't see that I would be in favor of stopping discussion on that and just acknowledging that consensus of like that might be the approach you take if you feel like there is a lack of respect, but I don't think we need to spell it out in here. That's my opinion. Liz. Um, I think that the, the policy is really geared towards um, school board members and how they're interacting with the public or, the, or, or how those schools. So I think that's really where we're getting at. I understand, you know, we, obviously we all want to be respectful of each other, but we're all in elected positions to sort of speak our mind. And so, you know, if I say something that somebody else doesn't agree with, does it go against a, a re respect? It, you know, I think, and I think part of this conversation is like, well, what is respect? You know, because I didn't hold the door for you, am I being disrespectful? So I, I guess my, it, for lack of better terms, I think this policy is a little bit fluffy, and I and I guess I would hesitate to sort of expand it on beyond anything else. If somebody had a serious ethics concern with how somebody was acting, that would go through the ethics policy. Obviously, I want to take the policy seriously, but I I, I, I hesitate to sort of expand it any further than where it's at, and that's sort of what I'd recommend. Okay, have we finished the discussion? Um, all right. Can I just uh, yes. can I just clarify that um, when we take our vote on the respect policies, that we are also voting to the highlighted changes I have presented to you in yellow, which appear in this copy, but not in the copy you received in your packet. I just that's why they're in type. The highlighted section shows the proposed change to what is in the um, what your packet shows as the policy. And, could you just clarify the additional changes? So we added school board chairperson and vice chair. Yes. Or yep. blah, blah, blah. 
plus the highlighted change. Was there any others? Yes, mm -hmm. correct. I have in BCA. There was no other changes. Was no, there? those are the ones I have. But the other two were um, changed to mirror the language of the BCA for so any person who alleges first. a violation of this well, policy is asked to immediately report any violation of this policy by a, and it would be whichever body. So if it's the student, it would be student there. If it's an employee, it'd be employee there. If it's school board, it'd be school board there. Whichever body the re policy is referring to. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. I think my question was answered though. I don't okay. know what. Okay, so the only change to the BCA is the chairperson Team slash chair. vice chairperson and then okay. the vice chairperson and a board okay. member selected at random. Um, and then we're, we're changing line three, um, treated with respect by school board members in their working. So those are the three changes to that One more. policy. You're going to need to put the vice chair yeah, for the, um, mm -hmm. so if the vice chair is the respect okay. issue, then it would be the chair and chair. the second person. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yep. right. So that is line um, 17 slash 18. Right, yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then we're also changing the title and the code. The, the code will get changed, which we don't know, but it will include B, and the title will say <laughs> respect, colon, school board. I wonder if we should vote on this right now while it's fresh yeah, in our minds. Yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have a motion to approve BCA respect? We approve for first all of them reading together? Just BCA first right now. We're just doing this one. Yes, yes. this is for yes. first yes. reading. Yes. Yes. It's yes. actually technically listed it's as a single reading, reading because oh, okay. um, it was recently approved. This was just our teasing out the language, okay. so it does not have to go through a second reading. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Move okay. to approve with the second. changes. Thank noted. you, Pip. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, let's move on to GBEBE. -E. Margo, do you okay, want to start? So just to clarify again, the title would say respect, colon, employees. <laughs> um, and then lines five, six, seven to be in lockstep with the others, it would read, in order to ensure a climate characterized by mutual respect, employees will practice common courtesy and civil behavior towards students, parents, guardians, community members, and elected officials in all situations. So that yellow is just reworking that initial blurb to appropriately tie to the group for which coding G applies. And then um, lines 10, 11 under um, procedures would read, instead of what you have in front of you, would read any person who alleges a violation of this policy is asked to immediately report any violation of this policy by an employee to the assistant superintendent or the superintendent, and I'm noticing an error there, it should also say to an administrator, the assistant superintendent or the superintendent. So there's three people. There's three Admi people okay. there. Administrator, assistant superintendent. That's superintendent. a typo. Okay. There. Any discussion on this? <clears throat> Pip. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that in the proposed change number two, which is in lines five, six, and seven, um, that it should include the words, um, <laughs> um, to each other, I think, because um, I think yes. that our last one, I You're think right. the school board one included that, but the employees should um, practice mutual respect right. and comma, yep. common courtesy toward each other, and then comma students, parents, guardians. I, yeah, Carrie, I think it's covered though in toward one another. Does it stand toward one another? Yeah, line, line seven. seven. Oh, okay. I'm only looking at the proposed changes. I'm sorry. Okay. Mm. Did you get that? I have it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other comments about? Or after guardians. <laughs> yes, we have that. Yeah, yeah. That's highlighted. Got that in. Um. Okay. Everyone in favor of this? G B E B E. Oh, you sheet? know, I'm sorry. I think Pip was right, though. I mean, it didn't translate into number two. Yep, I'm um, looking at that right you got now. got that? Okay. So just read it to me. It should say, practice common courtesy and civil behavior towards... Ensure climate characterized by mutual... parents, guardians, community members. Uh, one another has to be in the beginning. And elected officials yep. will practice 
toward one another, students, so parents. Mm -hmm. That's it. Got dropped. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you now. Kudos to the policy okay. committee Nick. on this one. Yeah. Uh, one last small thing. Um, it seems like the JICDE didn't have guardians added to the mm -hmm. list. We're just I put it G in on. Oh, wait. Uh, Proposed change number two for JICDE. Oh. Mm -hmm. Are we doing the, oh, okay, yeah. them, right. cool. the other two together? Um, or, we, uh, no. Why don't we vote on this one and we'll move on. We'll make yeah, it easier for everyone. I'm sorry. Yeah. I may have been on the wrong one. Which one we are, are we on? GBE. Okay. Never mind. Good. Do we have a I'm motion? There. Do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve. And yes. Aye. Second. Pip. Pip. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Now we move on to students, J I C D E. So again, same changes, except for as Nick just pointed out, guardians was accidentally left off. I will make sure it says one another for the lines six, seven, eight. And the um, additional um, line comment number five was that since this was a student and we wanted to make sure that um, students were never silenced if they were experiencing um, mistreatment oftentimes that would re they will feel most comfortable reporting to a teacher but um, that additional line is to make sure that the teacher takes it takes it up the line um, and, and passes the concern forward so that second sentence there of if the violation is first reported to a teacher or counselor it is then their responsibility to report the violation to an administrator assistant superintendent or superintendent okay any comments do we have a motion to approve JICDE? So moved. Second. <clears throat> and Liz. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Motion passes. <clears throat> we'll move on to JIC. Okay. I'm extracurricular and co curricular activities. So I can make a motion on this one. I'm passing out the um, one second, Liz, the cleaned up version. A lot of you, it was very difficult to read the, um, the policy committee is trying to show you the evolution of the policies as the recommendations come about, but because <laughs> there was a lot of recommended changes to IGD, did you guys get enough down there? Um, uh, this is a, this is, this is the cleaned version of, um, the one that you read with the minor change the policy committee was able to meet on friday but the um, packet had already gone out and we acknowledged in that meeting that we recognized it used the term high school when in fact this policy would apply to both the middle school and the high school since those are our two schools that have extracurricular co-curricular activities and school athletics so we took out where any reference to high school and put in students or instead of high school principal it says building principal so that that was the policy committee was able to meet on friday um so this is the clean version I, I, here's what i i would say to um set the stage for our conversation it has been a very long um process of review for the policy committee and one that we we really appreciated doing i think this policy to my understanding, having, having only been on the policy committee two years, this has frequently come up over the last decade, this policy IDG, which is being recoded as JJA. And I think one of the themes the policy committee continued to hear by um, any party involved, uh, uh, admin, uh, coaches, students, parents, was it was almost impossible to find a way to make the policy equitable there was there was problems on all sides of it um, and the intention of the policy from the get-go was um, with the wellness of our students in mind that we did not want students to be involved in breaking the law right obviously drinking um, vaping using drugs those are against the law and when we took a step back at the policy and the conversations we heard related to discipline what we really heard was um, the need to be thoughtful and intentional about how we set our students up for success as it relates to wellness. And the, and the blurb in the beginning of the policy talks about the value of extracurriculars. And I think we can all agree that extracurriculars build our students and, and make them better citizens and more well-rounded. And what was 
what came out of our conversations was the need to take a larger role in ensuring that we accurately communicate to our students the dangers of drinking alcohol, drug use, on um, how that can impact their performance, how that can impact their team. And so what you're noticing in the change is that we have taken, um, we have aligned it with our former JICD policy, which is our main discipline policy in terms of how we respond to um, situations rela related to conduct. And that also refers us to JIC. If you read JIC, you'll notice that the first line is always a restorative response um, where they try to identify um, the needs and, and repair and get the child back as it was a large um, common theme that it was a concern that if extracurriculars were healthy, the removal of extracurriculars might um, lead us down a path of more behavior problems. So this was an effort to um, be more clear in how we respond and um, also re-emphasize when we are talking about extracurriculars is to build up the value we place in them and the, the shared responsibility both the organizers and the participants have in understanding when it says good citizen and in good academic standings, we have a shared responsibility of openly and continuously renewing what that means. And what that means is drinking and doing drugs and those sorts are still against the law. Um, and there are consequences. The other change that you will see is it was not necessarily clear in the first policy that uh, extracurriculars and co-curricular activities are privileges, they are not rights, which is why when a violation comes up, it's the privileges that are the first thing that can be removed. Um, it is not a right. So it was, it was uh, the policy committee heard often that it was confusing why um, certain students were impacted by the previous policy and others were not. And that comes back down to what your privilege is, that if you were involved in an extracurricular, it's a privilege and it can be taken away. If you're not involved, there's nothing to take away. Um, and I will stop at that <laughs> and see if the other policy members had anything they wanted to add before we delve into a, a conversation on it. I also placed in that edit form that you just got the feedback that I received just so that you have all the comments that members shared with me to inform the dialogue that we have going forward. Do you need here, Lisa? Do you need that? We've been trying to share like, do we have, like pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> do other okay. policy committee members would like they like to comment first and then we'll open it up to the board? Yeah, I mean I, I so I in my request to make a motion was to, uh, going to be a motion to suspend the rules to approve this on a single reading. Um, the reason being, obviously, is that we're starting the school year in three weeks. I think we need to have a clear policy going into the school year. Um, as I'm sort of looking at this right now, um, I see kind of where there might have been some confusion at the policy committee meeting about this ineligibility from participation. It still is essentially providing um, some space for um, the school to act on out of school um, statute violations. Um, the reason why I um, advocated and continue to advocate for um, a change in this policy is the fact that um, when a child is um, has police involvement or gets busted at a party or something happens outside of school, um, the police. Um, and our Portsmouth Police Department um, have a great uh, uh, setup to handle um, that uh, interaction as through diversion and other programs which actually encourage extracurricular activities to divert kids from um, using substances or um, seeking entertainment in other ways, should I say. Um, but also our state statutes provide that um, the 
are criminals. They're they're not criminal statutes. The juvenile statutes are supposed to be therapeutic and not punitive. So it it was very concerning to me that um, the school takes a punitive approach through taking away. Um, extracurriculars. Obviously, if a child is not being safe towards other students, I understand um, having to remove them from uh, an extracurricular, but I guess I would employ the school and employ the superintendent through the principal um, to create um, uh, other avenues for um, addressing through using JIC, JICD, and JICDD um, to have a first line therapeutic approach. Um, to any incident that uh, may be brought to their attention. However, I do not believe that the school should be getting involved in um, the out-of-school activities of uh, students unless they do come in and affect the school day. Um, so we did give some examples, or we tried to talk through some examples of what that might look like. Um, let's say there was a party, the party was busted, um, and next thing you know, one kid in class, everybody's talking about him or something's happening, then, you know, could the school then bring that child in, um, you know, talk to the child, have them go to uh, counseling? It's my understanding right now that um, that the school may employ a method of um, having each um, child go to the uh, counselor for 20 minutes um, to talk through what's going on. Um, but, you know, I really do think that we should have a LADAC on campus at the high school. Um, I think that there needs to be a better approach and um, I would employ both the, you know, employ both the uh, superintendent and the school board to um, really, um, you know, think about this and if we have to create some sort of policy surrounding what is the next step if, you know, if this is too vague and, and, and sort of assigning a policy that provides for that late act you know, or that next step um, in these situations. Um, but it, it was really the policy committee's understanding when, when this was edited that we were removing the in the presence of language and we were removing language that would provide particular um, consequences for out of school activities and instead referring to the JIC, JICD, and JICDD policy, policies which provide um, the principal um, I believe the principal, maybe the superintendent, with the sort of um, uh, steps and approach to um, addressing any concerns that may come in and affect the school day. Um, I am, I guess, I am a little bit concerned though with this um, ineligibility from participation bit. Um, uh, and how it's still in there, but um, but I do think that we need to. I would implore the board to to approve this policy tonight um, uh, and motion to spend the rules to approve on the single reading so that we can get this um, off to the high school and middle school um, in our policy uh, into our policies before the school year starts. Thanks. Anyone else like to comment? Pip. I would. Um, I have to say. Well, first I want to echo what Margot said, which is that we, it it was. Um, it was a significant undertaking to take this policy on, but I'm really glad we've done it. And unfortunately, I agree completely with Liz that we've missed the mark with this edit of it because you're right, it was the intention of the policy committee not to allow for, um, allow for disciplining for outside behavior unless it impacted the learning environment or the safety of kids in school. And I don't think that we've arrived at that. <laughs> um, I think that that, that paragraph uh, does suggest that there is room for, um, room for doing just that. And I think the intention was that it would, should only be, there should only be an impact if it affected those two things, the learning environment or the safety of that student or another at school. Zach, do you want to comment? Uh, that's also, I would say simultaneously, I'll confirm. That's my, my understanding of the intent of the majority of the committee and thus the committee. Uh, I think that's right, that that would, that would, that would be removed. Um, I would, for the whole board, respectfully just reiterate what I, what I said at the policy committee, which is as I, I, you know, I have concerns on the operational side about, um, about the impact, um, and I think when I 
talk to administrators, I think there is a, there is a belief that this does change behavior um, in a way that creates safer environment for some of our kids when they're off campus. I understand the equity concern that this only only addresses students who are engaged in extracurricular activities because education is a right and extracurricular activities are a privilege. Um, so I will <coughs> respect the process um, and simultaneously um, and, and say that I believe that, that is true. That is the intent of the of the committee is that that would go away, uh, and that we would effectively um, not be engaged in any activity that was off campus. Um, and I am concerned about that approach, but I respect the will of the committee. Lisa, so I'm really deeply conflicted on sort of where we've arrived with this. I agree with the idea that we want students to have a very clear mandate of what's expected when they show up for their activities and when they show up for school and the clock is ticking. I also see just some lack of clarity in the language as it is drafted right now and I did send you guys a bunch of copy edits which did not make the list here. No. I don't want to like bother everyone with all of them, but I think many of them change the meaning or leave it open for interpretation in ways that could be potentially disruptive and counter to what we're hoping to accomplish. And one of my big picture concerns with this, if we are considering how we want to structure it, beyond just the who we're punishing and why, is to be really intentionally delineating the difference between extracurricular and co-curricular and we do not do that here we muddle them up together quite a lot like you can't kick somebody out of band because they're failing math because band is a class so and I don't want us to micromanage exactly how all the things are handled but I just want to make sure that as we're cleaning up the language that we're super clear when we're talking about things that are academic and when we're not and I don't think we've quite done that so I don't know as a matter of procedure if it is possible for us to arrive at some version tonight and then take another whack at it but I feel like that would be disruptive to kids so I guess I'd like to hear from Zach I mean I if guess I, our, I'd like to ask Zach the question as you the know the guy who's talking to the principals about what they have to give marching orders to people on you know when do they need to have a sort of drop dead this is your marching orders for fall because we're coming really can I, close can I just to that clarify no, from the policy no, Liz, committee Liz, no but what we we have other people in line wait. you need to I know wait. but we were First in the process you, you, you asked me to wait you asked me to wait you need to respect the same first of all zach is going to speak so can we the question one more time i'm sorry i just want to understand practically speaking like we're here in august school is starting soon sure you know we have a drop dead of giving people like instructions like we're going to sit kids in rooms and tell them what they have to do and what they can't do and we're telling teachers and coaches and advisors what they have to do you know broadly right when's the drop dead on that i so, guess like, my impression was it was this was the target date right right because then it's what's <laughs> People have students in what's the August causes? 20th. August twentieth is 20th, causes meeting. The 20th okay. is causes meeting. Thank you. So that's the, that's the time when you have a captive audience to discuss okay. parents, students, coaches, um, what the expectations are. Okay. Hope. So I have a little laundry list here that I'd like to walk through. Um, I too am not comfortable with where we landed. I applaud the policy committee because I think we've made improvements and we're moving in the right direction um, but I have a lot of concerns still left with what I see this policy we have for um, eligibility very loose words like behavioral expectations and requirements of this and other school board policies that we're placing on our students shoulders and yet we underwhelmingly communicate those expectations and requirements out and so i i really have problems with holding students accountable any more than i would an employee or a board member uh, accountable for things that are not being clearly communicated out to them i mean we jumped around a lot with policies tonight in our own confusion imagine a student and and i know that it has been said to me well all students get the handbook they know that's old school thinking and just to be frank very narrow-minded all students do not get the the handbook 
our handbook is now digitally online and it is still outdated. So let's just be clear about what students have access to as well as the parents. Um, and we still have not addressed ESL students, you know, other students coming in from other languages. Um, I'm, I'm hosting a student myself this year and I had to send them the very specific link of information to look at because they wouldn't have been able to navigate it themselves. So I, I don't think we need to make the assumption that this information's out there and it's the student's responsibility to access it. Um, when parents themselves, when we went through this process, were very surprised by a lot of the information they received and didn't know how to access it themselves. Um, secondly, I, I am concerned about we, we jump around in, in like line 60 talking about reference to JICD. Then if you go to JICD, it references you to JIC. The language is not consistent in JICD and JIC um, based on some of the things that I've looked at and how the groups that we're referencing and even the um, disciplinary components of the language. So I would put a request forward that this go back to the policy committee to look at the reference policies of JICD and JIC and mirror the language um, throughout each of the policies. Um, also, I, I do have concern that we're talking about, it was, it was very clear in many of the presentations made by employees and administrators as well as students and teacher, I mean students and parents, that the process in which they went through, there was a burden up on the athletic director and principal with it being such a small committee. Um, we specifically came to a conclusion that we wanted restorative measures and yet the procedure is still the same. I don't even see that a counselor's been added to the disciplinary committee, and that is something that we had discussed, that if it was going to be a restorative, there was going to be a consideration of mental health and the capacities for solutions to minimize into mental health impact upon students, that counselors should be involved in those discussions. There was many things that I felt were productive and a restorative approach by the presentations of our counselors that just quite frankly probably would not come to an AD or a principal's mind in the same way as it would a trained counselor or professional mental health representative being sitting at the table. Um, so I don't feel, I feel that falls short of, um, of a restorative approach. So I would like to see that expanded. Um, as well as I have concerns around the co-curricular activities, um, wording and, and piece. So I'm not prepared tonight to pass this as a first, first reading, fine, but as a complete, I understand the need for a procedure, but the need for speed has gotten us in trouble in the past mm -hmm. here. And I think if we're really looking for restorative, and I do agree with Lisa and Pep, and Liz around if a police officer is on site and that police officer has handled the situation, I do not feel that as a school board member, I have the right to impose a policy that goes above the law. Um, so I, I do feel like if it's an off-campus situation that police officers have intervened and they have set the tone, that's the tone that should be followed by the school. And you had your hand up. I did. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with, with Hope about the restorative plan because I think, I think that could be a real learning experience for a lot of students. <clears throat> but most especially, I am very much in favor of leaving in, in the presence of, because I think it's the only way that stops the drinking. If a student knows that he is in the presence of drugs or alcohol, then he needs to get out of there, plain and simple. And, and we heard at our previous discussion about having designated drivers. Well, if you have a designated driver, you're planning to drink. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. So, so that's, that's my major thing. I like the aspect of the student conduct committee instead of uh, discipline. 
Um, and I, I don't believe this is punishment. I believe there are consequences. And I think all behavior needs to have logical consequences. So those are my major points. Terry. Um, Thank you, Ian. So I, I see the components and, and, you know, opportunities for improvement, but I mean, this is such a huge shift from where we were at and address, let's say, 95% of, you know, the goals that the school board set to, to the policy committee. Um, the one thing that I just wanted to point out that I think is sort of a discrepancy and, and just to openly acknowledge that there was incident that prompted this deep dive, right? And so our share, many of our concerns are coming from parents affected and parents not affected that are petrified of their athlete losing their scholarship and things like that because of what happened before. And so in currently I'm in favor of moving forward with this as is um, and 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 would consider doing a single reading too in order to give parents the response they've been asking for for months and I know our process is different we have to follow process but the one thing I, I just wanted to one of the concerns and I'm just curious if this came up in the policy committee discussion was that um, you know, there was sort of a phenomenon. So, um, for instance, Portsmouth police use a very restorative approach. There's not, students aren't going to be charged on a first offense or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a discrepancy to me in that approach and their supportive approach. Let me get you connected to programs. Here's these things, um, suspended, you know, charges, things like that. And, and the terminology of um, under ineligible uh, line 50 um, students who violate federal state or municipal because in the situations that were brought to us in the spring it was very clear to me that these students um, that were were not charged with anything they were not they the the school made maybe even research these activities to get this information it wasn't actively provided to them they actively sought it out um, and so I think that another opportunity to clarify is what we mean by violate law is and to me that would be up to our criminal justice systems um, and to acknowledge that there's a huge delay in that so if someone is charged with possession of fentanyl then that's gonna be a nine month plus thing until they're charged you know, until the, those charges are found so, I mean, I, I don't know. I just wanted to provide that context, see if that violate came up in whose decision making that is. Nick, did you want to say something? Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Um, so first off, I actually, I appreciate a few of the edits farther up on the document. Um, I think there are, there is some good clarity added there because there are a few things that were just randomly ambiguous that I appreciate cleaning up. So. What I'm curious about is kind of the teeth of the bill is, or the policy regards that you can be suspended from eligibility for a extracurricular or co-curricular activity for violating a law. But the old policy had like a pretty specific framework for how that was to be implemented. Like, you know, you have you miss 50 percent of your games unless you do this or that. But that's all been removed as far as I can discern, which leaves me with the definition ineligibility from participation as a result of a violation for the foregoing will be effective during the time the student is involved in the activity during which the violation occurred. What does that mean? I'm having a very hard time wrapping my head around that. <laughs> I can Thanks. clarify that if you need it. So the, yes, please. Yeah, the former policy, um, so we can talk about the situation that it came up with those were all students that were actually not in their current sport and they were suspended from their sport okay. when it started up so the violation happened in february the sport hadn't started yet so the former policy read that it was continuous for the whole year so if i'm a soccer player and i get the policy handed to me in september but then that's the only sport i play and then i'm caught at a party in february then I would lose 50% of my soccer games because that's the next sport that I applied to. So it was oh. continuous. So this would only say it would only impact 
the activity you're in if you violate it when you're involved in the activity. If you're not in an activity and you're found of a violation, and there's nothing to remove you from. Right. Can, I, can, I, cl can it, I clarify from the policy committee like what our process was a little bit more? Liz, not everyone has had a chance to speak, so. I just think it'd be good for us to clarify how we got to here, because I don't think I gave a good enough clarification. Um, there is meeting minutes within our agenda that sort of lays out some of the discussion, but obviously not all the discussion. When we got to the policy committee meeting, not this past Friday, but on July 15th, um, we had policies JIC, JICD, and JICDD in front of us. And those policies actually cover out of school activities. They cover the process for the principal. And I will say that the high school principal was supportive of the JIC, JICD, and JICDD and the ability to work with them. Um, and so the real question was why do we even have? this IDG policy because the um, model policies within the New Hampshire School Boards Association does not have an IDG policy. So, you know, do we just do away with it and does JIC and JICD and JICDD cover everything? Probably, um, but I think the, the, the reality was is that maybe there was something for extracurricular with NHIA that we sort of needed to cover having something um, that sort of refers back to, and, and so I guess my ad would be to see also JIC and JICD and, and JICDD to clean that up a little bit. Um, but I mean, you know, this was a meeting that was supposed to be an hour and I think we were there for three hours. Um, and then we also had a meeting on Friday and we got the edits back on Friday from Kathleen and we had sort of questions and I mean Zach posed to us well how am I supposed to do this and we're like well actually we don't want you to do that so <laughs> I think um, I think that some of the language is still off I think the reason why we had so I think we should probably remove the in, the ineligibility from participation um, but I think part of maybe keeping that was in case somebody did have a major violation of a statute and um, you know, but I would think police, you know, uh, what would that look like? You know, um, would they be suspended from school? And I think the JIC, JICD, and JICDD would cover, you know, somebody doing something, um, you know, heinous. And I would hope that the criminal justice system would cover that too. As far as the student conduct committee goes, um, I think that there was discussion around that in in what would that look like, but essentially we're still looking at JICD and JICDD for the the um, the uh, principal and whatnot to sort of direct it. I think the student conduct committee may still be in there, uh, and again, I, you know, we don't have detailed minutes on this, but I think it may still be in there because if the principal were to decide that maybe this was a consequence, then there would need to be some sort of meeting between the athletic director and the coach and whatnot to to sort of understand what that is. But I think that would be like a third line, fourth line consequence or, or, or source, or so to speak, you know, a restorative piece if it were to be um, after, the, after the restorative pieces. So, um, you know, we also, I had brought into question, you know, um, uh, folks that have uh, behavioral uh, IEPs, um, you know, and what would that look like? They are, that's sort of covered under something else. Um, and so really the, the, I think the purpose or what we were trying to get at was to try to gut out some of that stuff that's just not in best practice model policies, although it may be in every city in the, New Hampshire to, to have this um, policy of in the presence of um, it's not a model or best practice policy within the New Hampshire School Boards Association. And, um, and I think that with that being said, um, you know, I, it's not what our state statutes gear towards when children get in trouble. It's supposed to be restorative. So I think the issue that maybe everyone at this table may be running into is that you haven't looked at JIC, you haven't looked at JICD, and you haven't looked at JICDD, or you have, I understand that this, this just seems odd in, in, the, in the first instance, um, but I guess, the, you know, short of getting rid of it, I would, I would like to approve something tonight on a first reading so that we can get rid of some of it, 
and then go back and, and try to link the JIC, JICD, JICDD together and figure out if we even need this new JJA IDG policy. Margo. I can address, you know, only since we've been more in the weeds with researching this, a couple of things I can say. Um, Hope, I totally agree with you about communication, but that is considered procedural, not policy. So I agree with you. It feels uncomfortable to say we're referring to these things, but it wouldn't be the proper place to spell out them in a policy. It goes down to how is the policy enforced. So I agree, but that's why it's not stated in the policy of what exactly is communicated, but just that behavioral academic board policies. So that's why it's not spelled out because that question was raised in multiple policy meetings. With regards to um, concerns raised about JIC and JICD, those were approved by the board on January 11th of 2022. So they literally just went through an edit. I don't think we can request for those to go back. I mean, we can request, but they were just, just passed by this entire board in front of us on January 11th. So that, um, they do read a little bit differently, but they read differently in terms of the infraction and the process that you follow. And, and I will say that um, the, the principal was comfortable with working within the confines of those policies. And then um, when, Carrie, that was a great question you asked about this ineligibility. And here's what I can say. Um, I think, I think, I wasn't on the board, but I think what we tried to do as a previous board is take the, um, what most schools have it as an athletic code of conduct and what the school board has as an extracurricular policy. And we lumped those in and then threw in co-curricular. And we tried to make our own hybrid version. So JJA, which is the new coding, is what the board, the New Hampshire School Board Association identifies as their extracurricular. Most of the language that we had that we cut out was in what other schools have specifically in their athletic handbook, not their school board policy book under code of conduct. And so to go back to you, Carrie, that last piece about ineligibility, that is a carryover from what's um, in the NHIAA. So if you're in a sport and you are busted by the law, you would, you're, you would be removed. And that, in, that, that is a continue over, but it is a fair conversation to have as to whether it belongs with the edits we've made because we're trying to merge several um, and hope great catch that was an oversight not to have the counselor on um, the committee that would review um, um, a restorative plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which again, this is where it goes into sometimes the danger of spelling things out too much in a policy is it locks us into a hole that isn't really the one that we wanted to go down. If you follow JIC and JICD, it just basically says uh, it's the building principal and his designees to determine. So sometimes the danger of spelling this out here makes it look like we're going to hold ourselves to this very narrow process that may not get out intended outcome. So. It's a great question to raise. I don't have the answer for it, but I do see how that reads strange and moves away from the in intent of those discussions. Hope. In, in follow up to that, is that not, do we not have the availability to then put in consistent language in this policy saying the AD, this assistant principal, I'm sorry, I don't have that policy in front of me right now. Um, the JSC. Yeah, and, and designated uh, appointees by the principal, be that a counselor or be that whomever else he feels needs to be at the table for that particular disciplinary committee and restorative plan. Because that would be it, consistent. It, yeah. And that's where I have problems with we reference, we, we tell parents and students, again, you need to reference JICD, you need to reference JIC, but then when you go to those policies, I'm happy that the principal can work in the confounds of those policies, even though the language isn't consistent, but, but, but he's a principal. He does that every day. He makes adjustments. A, a parent and a student working in those confounds of understanding the language is a little different when we're looking at the comments of restrictions for extracurricular activities, but then in the other policy, we're trying to fold in co-curricular activities, but there's no mention of co-curricular co-curricular activities in the other two policies at all. So I, I just think that, again, 
for communication and consistency sake, we need to be a little more thoughtful about mirroring our language if we're going to be referencing other policies to support a, a current policy that we're passing through. This, this was one of the biggest problems we had around the confusion of this policy, besides the point being in the presence of. And I will remind people that being in the presence of does not always mean being in the knowledge of the presence of either. So I, I know people say, well, students go to parties, they know there's alcohol and drugs, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that. So there's, there's knowledge of that and there's presence of the knowledge of that. Those are, those are different things. I did have a question around the language of free. Um, in 76, the committee is free to consider input from the student or their representatives, because I know a lot of students and parents did express that they felt like they just told their story and that was it, and then it, the sentence was brought down. Um, again, I feel like free is loose. If, if I'm a committee member, that gives me the opportunity to say, well, I'm free to consider, but I'm also free to not consider. And so, I'm just wondering if we can have a little more definitive around are we saying that they will have the opportunity and that is to be expected or um, about able? is the committee just, just able to able. loosely decide that? Let Lisa speak first. I, okay. I, I just have a no, 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 Liz. Uh, and Lisa? Pip, no. Lisa and Carrie. And, and then Pip. And then Liz. Oh, Pip. Pip. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Lisa, go ahead. <laughs> Two, I think, sort of quick language questions here. Um, one is, I do wonder, I mean, I was at only one of the policy committee meetings around this, and Steve Canosi was there, and one of the things that he said that really struck me was that he doesn't want this to get so prescriptive that he can't respond to the situation in a way that's flexible and takes into accommodate you know takes into account a lot of the things that we're talking about like whether kids have language issues or behavior issues or any other things that are going on and I'm concerned as I'm reading through this again that we really do still prescribe quite a lot which people are going to be in the room you know I wonder whether students should be able to say hey but wait maybe my math teacher is who really knows my life and could speak for me and that's I don't want to dictate that that's who should be there, but I'm also concerned if we're dictating exactly who's sitting there that we may not always be creating the best process for each kid or for each set of circumstances. So I wonder if we can leave that just at the principal's discretion. Um, and I'm also curious because we did do this with one other policy earlier in the year where we thought that communication was a huge problem whether it would be permissible to consider adding language simply that directs the building principal or directs the superintendent to create a simple language handbook for kids before the start. I mean, or would, I don't want to overly like get bogged down, but in these places where we think that the kids and the parents who have to follow this have no clue whatsoever what it's about, I don't think it would be terrible to say as a board that we want somebody in leadership to take ownership of that and communicate it like not to say what they have to say or like what format it could be it could be one of your videos or it could be you know like a fact sheet but i just we truly suck at telling kids what to expect when it comes mm. to discipline and we've been bad at it for quite a while and it's not a problem just in one building so i don't think it's a blame situation it's just that we need to shift that culture so I don't want to overly dictate that, but I do wonder if it would be reasonable to consider just saying that somebody does need to own that as a piece of what happens with this. Like if the students are obligated to follow the rules, then we need to be obligated to tell them what the rules are and not citing code and like 40,000 like words that are in a, you know, Oxford English dictionary somewhere. Okay, I think I said carry next and then Pip. 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 You said me and then Pip. Then I just have a sentence. I just wanted to clarify that um, JICDD, I'm sorry, it's just one sentence. So JICDD basically says, well, it says, discipline may be imposed if such out of school conduct causes a significant disruption or substantial interference with the school's educational mission, purpose, and objectives. So JICDD is what lists off these things, that, these out of school activities, like using alcohol and tobacco products if it creates this substantial disruption. So that's really what I was falling back on, and I think the committee was falling back on in mm. how we talk about 
um, out of school activities moving forward. Carrie. Um, I appreciate that clarification and also Margo's clarification and then also rereading and getting focused on the violation piece, just seeing that it may be de determined and eligible. I'm like good with that now, so thank you. Um, and I think that, I, and I was looking back to our list of topics for Zach for upcoming meetings, which is already long. And one that we talked about um, prior to this um, with Lisa's, you know, really initiation was really like a full discipline policy look. And as, um, as, we, as Hope has brought up and other folks, there's lots of tweaks and changes and inconsistencies. Um, and so I just want to, um, I, I think it's worthwhile in this discussion to maybe bracket some of those to, we've already acknowledged we need to do this disciplinar, disciplinary policy and all of the alphabets that go under that. And so really our decision tonight is on this. Um, and then I, because of the, the this is the issue that I have by far and large heard the most from parents and folks in the community and concerns and people, I, I think something needs to be done. So I would just implore us to, um, despite some um, minor concerns, that I think this is address, addresses all of the major concerns that were brought up in our previous discussion. So I'd like to see us move forward with voting on did, this did or you want to say something? I did. And Thanks. then I'd like to say something. Um, Zach too. Nick. I, um, yeah. I, I like where you landed, Carrie. I think that's a good way to go forward. I think um, one thing that I wanted to note is that I do think, to be honest, I do think this policy has been rushed a little, even though we've been talking about it for many months now and we've had all sorts of input, um, which was necessary. I think it was really good that we've had such a broad conversation about it. Um, but I think that we were all eager to get it out before the athletic contracts were signed. And, um, but I don't want to see us land. I like, I like some of the adjustments and I think I could, I could move forward gladly with it, um, as a, the first reading tonight. Um, but I don't think that, um, I think we have to remember that our policies are always changing and until a new policy replaces another one or until a policy is updated, we abide by the previous policy. So even if we had to go in and sign the existing policy for this fall, um, for the beginning of school this fall, we, it doesn't mean that we can't still work with this policy and make the changes that we really want to see. Because I don't, I don't want to stop short of getting to something that we're all really satisfied with. Um, and that, that also brings up the process that we're working to change. And um, I think we've had a good start with that. But I will, and, I, and I'm really appreciating this opportunity to have a conversation tonight because it is sort of the first opportunity we've had since we've updated it. Um, but I also am disappointed that the new process invited members of the board to give input. And we only received before our, between the two meetings where we discussed this, we only received input from one board member. Um, so I wish that we had been able to incorporate feedback from other board members into this draft so that we could be voting on a, a more finalized draft mm -hmm. at this point. So I would just encourage people um, to, to send their feedback. And I think that there may have been an issue of timing here because I, I think we're still not getting the time we need to be able to review and send feedback and then incorporate that feedback and then send it back for people to look at again. So. I guess I would just remind people that, that that process is still in the works and we're still trying to figure out the best way to do it. But we certainly want to take everybody's feedback into account. Ex excuse me, just for the record, I'd like to say, I think the timing of feedback is not fair to the other board members because it landed in the middle of summer. And so, you know, people were off. I know I was not even available on Wi-Fi at times. So, and was not, it wasn't clear when always that 
the, but the committee was meeting. Twelve months a so. year. Remember that. I know. I understand. Board members 12 I understand that, to but it's attention. not always clear when the policy committee is meeting on what, and so I. Well, if you read I, I think your you're communication, still working. you would know that. If so you read the communication, we I get, do read you would my know communication. That. As a matter of process, though, I do think that. I mean, I went home after the retreat and spent like several hours at my computer, mm -hmm. going line by line and yes. doing copy edits and sending them through, and they did not make it into they the draft. All of them. <laughs> There. No. All the school, high school, all removed. The high school and middle school pieces, some of it was, but not all of it. And then I get that it was of, quick. We did, we were, I'm sorry. But I think that. All right, I we, think we don't have to quobble about that. I'm not, I think Zach has something he would like to say. I think Lisa's I'd like to well, finish Lisa's that. Done. I just have one. Oh, quick. all right, if Lisa, you're not finished. I'm sorry. I thought you were just talking so about. So I think that that policy is, that process is a great start and it can be tweaked in the future because I really appreciated the chance to be able to do those line edits, but I don't think there was enough turnaround time. Mm -hmm for people to really double check things and collate and so we just need to build that in. And then I have one big picture question, which is when we started this many months ago, many of us wondered why we needed this policy at all. And I am <laughs> fundamentally unclear what its purpose is or whether we need it. And so I appreciate that this version is far superior to the version we started with many months ago, in my opinion. I know Anne may have a different opinion about that. Okay. And that's I have an answer. Can I have I'm an answer? But that. No. Well, that, I that's don't what I, my comment was know be. if we need it. And I just want to make sure that there's a clear reason that we need this that's separate from those other policies, which I did read and do seem to say that there can be discipline if there's a legal issue. This is and like if there's bullying that happens that impacts what's going on in the building and it happened at a party, we, we have action for that and other policies. And so I'm just not That's clear at the end of the day, do we need to fix this or can we ditch it? Okay, I think I'm going to take a minute here. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, just... um, I appreciate and I absolutely respect all the hard work that you all put into this. And I ask you to respect me at this point. I don't agree with it at all. I think we should keep the old policy or the existing policy for many, many, many reasons. I think, first of all, it's worked well for 10 years, 12 years, whatever it is. We had one party in Greenland. We had three parents come to our policy committee meeting. We had three parents come to our board meeting. I heard, I heard from um, the music department or the, the performing arts, there was one phone call into the performing arts that they didn't like the way the policy was implemented. It was one party, and all of this happened because of one party, okay? In the past, the reason why we created that original policy that we're dealing with now, 10 years ago, I chaired the committee that wrote the policy. We had parents from SAU 50, SAU 52. We had the athletic director, the superintendent, the principal. We, the committee was huge, and when they first told me I had to be the chair, I was like, this committee's too big. Well, we did a really good job of communicating with each other, of respecting each other, and we wrote that policy. The situation with underage drinking parties had gotten out of control. And I honestly believe that if we lessen the consequences, we're gonna see that again. We're gonna be revisiting this in a year or two. That's just my opinion and it's just based on what I lived through in the past. I, um, we've researched what other school districts do. They all have similar kinds of policies that we have. Um, I think to not spell out exactly what the penalty is isn't fair to the athletic director, to Steve Canosi, to the coach that are gonna sit on this committee, the student conduct committee. There's no guidelines for them. Talk about equity. Mm. One kid's going to lose two games, another kid's going to lose five games, and then the parents are going to say, well, how come? Why did my child lose two games and that child lost five games? There's no, talk about equity. There's no equity in this. The, the mistake we made when we wrote the policy 10 years ago is we didn't have a consequence for kids that weren't in an extracurricular activity. So we could have said, make, make that student go to detention for a month. You know, that, we, we, that totally went over our heads. We didn't get that at all. Um, I think another 
way we know that this policy works is we've never had a second offense. If you look at the policy, there's a first offense consequence, a second offense consequence, and a third offense consequence. I was told by Cause and years ago Russ Wilson, we never had a second offense, which means the first offense worked. Kids know that if they go to an underage drinking party or they whatever, that they're going to have that consequence. They're going to lose games. Um, and I know, I, I, you know, my kids, are, my youngest is 31, so she's not that old. I remember kids that lost the entire season. They lost their entire sports season. And that was it. That was the penalty. They hosted an underage drinking party. Like 100 kids showed up. Of course, the police came, and they got involved. So it was it worked you know those kids learned and it's funny i bumped into one of these kids last weekend at a wedding and i said to him what did you think of that and he said you know what it's the best le lesson i ever learned in my life he said i disobeyed the law i paid a penalty and then i never i i knew i could never disobey the law again he was a junior in high school when this happened um so I'm not in favor of lessening the rule. I think it works. I think it's worked for 10 to 12 years. It's prevented repetitive behavior um, in the presence of. So you go to the party and you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to drink. Well, like somebody said, you know there's going to be alcohol there. What? So either you go and you suffer the consequence if you get caught, or you don't go. You know. So I. I can't support it, and I really think it's going to put too much pressure, and I don't think it's fair on the athletic director, Steve Canosi, and whoever the coach is, because you don't have a defined consequence for those people. And that's not fair. Why should they have to endure that, that responsibility? It's not fair to them. Um, I don't know. I think we should move on with this. I'm obviously not in favor of it. But we have to decide what we're going to do, because obviously the consensus is you're in favor of this. So we have to decide what we're going to do. I mean, should we I, have I the policy committee go back and put these revisions in before the 20th? Can we meet before the 20th? Or, well, you know, I think it's time to kind of wrap up the discussion. Um, what are we going to do? What is the suggestion? I don't, you don't have to comment on my comments if you don't, you know, I think that's a waste of time at this point. Um, but I think we need to decide what we're going to do. I made a motion initially to suspend the rules to approve this on single reading. Um, if we wanted to do it with an amendment to eliminate a couple of the sections. Um, but I, I, I would separate the amendments from the motion. Okay, so but my first, the first motion would be that um, I had talk to Kathleen about my would be the motion to spend the rules to approve this um, on a single reading I think Marco's hand was up can we hear from her since she's also a, on oh, the policy committee no wait a minute wait. let's let's let Margo talk she did have her hand up before you Liz um, and our superintendent well, I think there's a motion and our the superintendent table, wants to talk I would just say two things Lisa asked a great question because I I had it, it is it was the policy committee originally did ask can we just get rid of the whole policy? That was very much a question, um, particularly because we have the JSEDD, which allows the school a place to step in to off-campus things when it impacts what we do as a school, learning, right? Um, the JJA is a school board policy, and the important thing that it outlines, which does link back to JSED, is it outlines that extracurriculars are a privilege and they can be removed and that's the value and it also outlines for example homeschool and students that are at independent schools that don't offer it they can participate so it does outline some key components of extracurriculars so to answer why do we have JJA well sorry what it's now being coded as JJA or why does the school board have JJA it's to define extracurriculars who can participate when they meet that you have to have certain eligibility requirements, which would be a physical academic standard. So that's why it's there. Um, we have adopted more to it than what is in the school board JJA. I will say that. Is there a statute that requires us to have a policy that spells out that somebody who's like homeschooled or charter school or whatever is allowed to participate? 
Okay. Oh, yeah. So that yes. needs yes. to be those somewhere statutes. because of yep. that. And they're okay. in those policies. They're in the homeschool Fair. policy, which links to this okay. policy. Okay. The other thing I would say, um, the former policy that we had, I know it has been mentioned, and I just have to clear for the public. Yes, other schools have similar policies, but no other school that I have researched has it as a board policy. They have it as an athletic code of conduct in their athletic handbook, and it falls solely on the athletic director and the coaches to hand down. And the, po <coughs> the policy that we had is word for word the exact policy that the New Hampshire um, NHIAA has listed under life of an athlete. It's not unique to Portsmouth, um, but it is very unique as a board policy. Mm -hmm. It is all found, in, and that's why what's unique about ours is that we have interwoven a bunch of things, but the way that ours was written was how every other district, because I've looked for it, and I went district by district, and the only place you can find it after calling New Hampshire School Board Association is through an athletic handbook mm -hmm. under the Code of Ethics. So. That is a huge difference between how we're presenting it and how every other school is acting on it. And I do think that's worth noting. And I would also say, I do, I hear the data that we haven't had a second violation and I'm respecting our board norms that we're not to talk about our experiences, but I would say being in a generation that has teens and tweens, my experience is that our policy has just made kids sneakier at partying. Mm -hmm. I don't, mm -hmm. I honestly, and I wish that weren't the case, I honestly don't think our kids are sitting around saying, I, I, what, what, let's, you know, let's not do that because we have policy IDG. Because <laughs> the kids that get, half the kids that the parents are angry are because those kids weren't drinking, they were there, and the parents thought there was nothing wrong with it, or maybe they were, and the burden of proof again is where we fall short, but, I, I go back to what I kept saying at the policy meeting. In my mind, what I've learned from all of this is that we as a district have to do a better job of teaching wellness and imparting on our students the knowledge of that choices have consequences, that choices related to substance abuse can um, affect performance both in the classroom and on the field, and, and more so, I would love to see us be the district that leads the state in let's have robust social planning for these kids because they want to socialize. They want to be somewhere, and this is what they know to do. And that's been generations of partying. So I wish that what we learn from this is wouldn't it be great if we've got coffee houses and air bands concerts, and those are things that kids want to do. And if we are the ones providing the opportunity in a safe space, they'll come and they'll make the good choice. So I, I think there's there's a values behind all this that we're, that we're learning. I wouldn't be comfortable going back to the old policy. I, I just, I can't, um, but that may not be the vote of the board and I know by the norms, what decision we go with, we stay with. So I am- We're board of the whole. We are board of the whole. <laughs> Have, Zach, wait a minute. Zach would like to. So speak. just, I mean, quick. Uh, just, I think there's a clear, there's a there's a value judgment conversation. That I think that that is, um, the importance of extracurricular activities in the lives of our of our students and what that does for wellness, and what the threat of the removal of extracurricular activities. Um, can do in terms of behavioral change that may or may not affect wellness. And the, I would say the old model for this was that the threat of the loss of that activity um, was worth the p potential behavior change of parties, of kids not being present at parties. Um, I would say that I respect the, what sounds like the majority of the board feeling like extracurriculars have been undervalued and the impact on student behavior as a result of the leverage of potentially losing extracurricular activities has been overvalued. I disagree with that judgment, but I respect the fact that that's the will of what sounds like the majority of the board. Uh, the, um, in terms of, I think, I, I think Margaret's making a really good point about the fact that this, when you, if you look at this and you have a, there's some of these <laughs> that happen where you have policies, that if you start looking at them, really look like procedures and they're not policies, and very often that's because boards make choices that there are certain things that are so hot 
that you need to build in policies to build in what is kind of procedural type stuff to be very specific to protect your employees who are trying to navigate very difficult situations. And you think about, in terms of that hotness, the best example I can give you is I haven't even been around for the Greenland Party, but the Greenland Party was hot enough with three, it sounds like three vocal here parents and then other parents who were probably talking to you to have you completely reconsider all your disciplinary policies across the entire district as a result of the outcome of one party. Mm -hmm. So think yeah. about that and laser focus that now. Take yeah. you out of the equation <laughs> and now put that on a high school principal and an athletic director and that take that and put that on those couple of people to then interpret in each situation unique sets of consequences. And I think you're gonna get what Nancy's um, talking about. Again, I respect the, the, the will of the board. I think if you're, if the desire is, I also think when people are saying that if you don't want any of that stuff, I think it sounded like the will of the committee was just throw this stuff out. Whatever happens out, off of campus happens out, off of campus. I do think that that is not reflective of what most schools in the region do because they've made, they made a different value judgment about that extracurricular value versus the potential to curb dangerous behavior amongst students. If all that's gonna happen anyways, I would ask, I know Carrie was talking about, like, let's have the version that we've got now and let's pass something and move forward. And, and I heard that because that will be responsive to what people politically were asking us to do. Um, my concern is if it's kind of a half-baked thing that is politically expedient, but is, is, like a, is like a really difficult to implement for people on the ground, then it's gonna be a mess. Um, and so I'd rather have you slow down, even if the inevitable direction of the board is to remove some of these things that I would disagree with, to do it at least well. Uh, and then to have those other pieces, I think Cope was talking about, you know, look at JICD, look at JICD, look at all these things within a context to make sure that it all makes, it's intellectually coherent from one place to another. So. so should we keep the existing policy for now and ask the policy committee to I, work well, on this? Yeah, I mean, there's, this? there's a motion on the table that I was looking for a second Well, nobody on. got a second, so I, if you don't have a second, it I doesn't I would like move. to comment, please, for a moment. Yes. Um, I just, since Zach, with all due respect, Absolutely. you Go are ahead. new to the table yep. here. Yep. I just want to clarify that this board has been moving and having discussions about moving towards restorative approach and policies across the board long before this policy came up or before the Greenland party. Right. And, and the Greenland party is not the only party in our history that has brought about this, I can think of at least four in the time that my kids have been at the high school in six years. So I just want to, to say that for the record. I do want to say, Nancy, I am willing to meet again in August as you threw that out. If, if that is an option for other people, you, you toss that out as meeting again. I would be willing to do that as well. I just want to, to respond to your your thought about that and I, I also wanted to respond around just reminding us that every year we have celebration graduation in our district which is a non-alcoholic graduation celebration that is an opt-in it is not mandatory it is an opt-in event in our district and it has the highest participation of our seniors every single year so our students are not just looking to go out and get trashed on the weekends. They could choose to go out every graduation and host parties all over our Seacoast area, and they don't. So I think when we give them the education around drinking and the opportunities to have other situations to choose from, they make the right choice. But I do agree with Margot. We did suicide training for our, our athletes this year have we done alcohol and drug training you know for our extracurriculars for for our co-curriculars for our sports whatever language we want to use it around we are in the business of educating we have to do a better job of educating um when when i was in sports a gazillion years ago <laughs> this was housed under athletics and i do think personally it's better housed under athletics than it is under the board. I do want to respond to Nick's point around the eligibility <coughs> piece. I, and, and I think, Nancy, you brought this up as well. I, I do think it's 
to the benefit to spell out what that looks like a bit more than what we have. And I think this policy and the policy committee attempted to do that in the participation piece of this policy of talking about you can participate in practices but not games. But I think we need to be a little more specific about what that looks like to give a little more guidance to the committee. <clears throat> All right, so Margot seems to feel we should vote on this. Um, why don't we have a motion? Can we have a motion? Well, we have to, we have motion to, to suspend the rules and approve on a single reading. I, I know, but we have to approve the policy. Yeah, I recommend doing the policy reading, first. We have to approve the policy yeah, first. But no, right now it's up for two readings. So no. I'm asking well, well, it for us to suspend the, policy the rules first, first. And then we'll say we want a single reading. Margo, what right, were we, you recommending? Yeah, Margo, why well, don't you I, take I, it over? We, I don't think we can. I don't think we can leave the conversation here, nor do I think this group is clear to leave the policy. I don't think there's unanimous choice to leave the policy as it stands in the policy book right now. So I think there's two options that stand before us. It's we can either, as a board, vote to send it back to the policy committee for immediate um, whatever you want to call uh, our immediate um, edits and changes and then we can have a um, short meeting of the board prior to August 20th to, okay. to vote on it or we can make some um, motions right now for suggested edits and vote on it as is. The policy committee meeting is not meeting until what September? We'd have to request an earlier meeting. Yeah, I, I we're just not don't, meeting. I just don't think it's going to be turned around like that. I agree. That's the challenge of the way it works. So I think we've got to. I have a question of clarification, please. Um, so if we vote on this policy and pass it as it stands tonight, or as it stands with future edits. Of future edits, will that be able to be the guidance that will cause can use on the twentieth? Yes. Wait, I have a question yeah. about that. Yes. So if it's only based on a first reading, yeah, the old policy the stands until we vote for second, second reading, reading, right? Yes, yeah, so we suspend the rules. vote to approve it. Well, I, I can't hear two people, just Nancy or Margot. The rule would be if we vote tonight on the first reading without another motion, it would have to come back to another board vote for a second reading. So yes. if we don't do that before the start of school, then the policy in place at the start of school is the old IG date. Okay, wait, and now I'm confused. Correct. I, I thought you just said if we vote tonight as a single reading with amendments, it can be approved with amendments, and that can go through as a single reading. And then those amendments can be made, and then it stands. You have to approve the single this reading first. Right now it's second up my motion. second readings. So it's a second, second Liz's motion. Second Liz's motion. Okay. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. So then we can discuss I'm, I'm it. Yes. 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 I am so we can discuss the final it. policy we, after the edits. We have, if we do two readings. If we do a single reading. Right. Right. Which, the which we've done before. Made, That's how we used to do it. That's how we used to do it. Okay. Because the board had so many new members, right. we went back to two readings. So this one is up for two readings. There's a motion on the floor, which I think got a second, yes. to uh, suspend the practice and move this to single reading. Yes. Then we can have a discussion on edits to um, accept prior to approving, to accept with approval of well, now, so now this is the discussion of whether to suspend the rules or not. No, it's not a discussion. We have to vote on your second. You, you made a motion. She made a second. So we have to vote on then but then it's it's single gonna, reading. We're discussing That's that now. <laughs> we'll be here till midnight if we do that. I, I, I yep. don't think that's a good idea simply because we'll be here till midnight to do that. All right, well, there's a second. What, so I, we can what I would vote. rather see us do is, is ask the policy committee to try to do all of this before August 20th, and we'll happen, have a, a meeting to we, um, approve the changes before before then. I think we need to vote on the motion that's on the floor. Yeah, yeah and, that, that. and, and, and then, there should be space for discussion in between, but I think we've already discussed it enough. Well, um, I would like to discuss a <laughs> bit, which is that I would, I support the motion that I seconded with the, um, with this, the specification that that this will go, that the policy committee will review and uh, this policy again and bring it back to the board. However, if we're approving it as a single reading, it would be in place immediately, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. That's, right. correct. That's yeah. correct. So I'd like to do both of those things. That would be my recommendation. Well, you're contradicting your motion then. 
If no, you I want don't them think to I am. bring it I would to like back to, to the board for approval, yes, I would, would like to approve it as a single reading for tonight. And then I would also like to refer it to the, to the policy committee to re review and update it. I see what you're so saying. So a second motion? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because that. I think we need both. I think we need something immediately. And I also think it needs work. But I understand that. But then if once they update it, if they bring it back, are you saying then bring it back just for us to see it or to approve it? Because oh, no, if no, it's approved, it's approve it. review and approve. Can that all be done review. by August 20th? No. No, no that's no. why I'm okay. suggesting both. Right. So what's, <laughs> what Pip is saying is that currently what's in place is IDG. We can tonight approve this as a single reading, which then this swaps out IDG. But then we can also make the recommendation that this gets sent back to the policy committee for edits which then they edit send back and then we could approve that so there'd be like a two rounds of approval is it, do i okay. hear you correctly yes, Pip? exactly does everybody agree that that's a good no, way to proceed all in favor oh, I, no no i think that we need to just vote on the motion to do a single reading and I that's it have a question about that still and we weren't given an opportunity to discuss it, but I'm uncomfortable approving a single reading without understanding what the amendment process will be and what the timeline will be for bringing back a cleaner version of the policy. Because I think whatever our position is, we're in agreement that this is not prime time. Right. Right. It's a great effort, and there's a lot of aspects of this that I like, but there's language issues, there's like a lot of structural questions that we all have. Mm -hmm. So if we're getting rid of the second read, I don't want to vote yes on that without knowing then what I'm getting in terms of an amendment process and a bringing it back to the board process. Well, I think we're I also, I feel like we have an order of operations problem here. Cause like if I'm just voting for this and then nobody agrees to amend it or bring it back. And we got garbage. Then we've got this thing that makes no sense that we garbage. just implemented. Can I, can I answer that? Still better than um, what's on so the So the policy now. committee is meeting on September 21st at 845. Um, I, we, we were kind of, you know, at the policy committee meeting on Friday, we were sort of left stuck to say, what are we doing? Because we received Lisa's comments. Um, we had gone through them. Some of them seemed, um, like they weren't substantive, maybe tweaks that we could make. Um, but needless to say, I, I don't think that what we had and the, the confusion that, uh, superintendent McLaughlin brought towards us in the poll you know brought forward I, I don't think that we were all on the same page i think we had similar confusion as to how to move forward um and so that was when i sort of clarified that you know obviously we needed to i felt like we needed to do something and that something was to what kathleen had suggested of doing a motion to suspend the rules to do a single or you know we could do a single reading um and so i guess you know, the, the, the concern though is that coming, you know, we could make minor tweaks tonight if there was some verbiage that's not gonna be substantial and we can make amendments right now to sort of eliminate, like if we wanted to eliminate the ineligibility from participation section, if, this, if the student conduct committee piece is enough based on JICD, um, we could sort of get do an amendment to get rid of that tonight um, and do that, but I, you know, my understanding is that the first then or the next meeting of the policy committee where Kathleen will be there and everybody's going to be there and everybody's available is September 21st. So then the next school board meeting after that would be the 27th. So there would be a meeting on the 21st, which is a Wednesday, and then there would be a school board meeting the following Tuesday. I, there was question at the policy committee about how are we going to turn around a packet or how are we going to return around updates before that um, Tuesday meeting. But I guess the hope would be that if we did do a meeting on the 21st or we have our meeting on the 21st, that um, things could go into the packet and, you know, or up the packet could be updated, you know, Thursday, Friday, some sort of turnaround. But I know uh, Superintendent McLaughlin expressed some concern too, I think, at the meeting of as far as turnaround goes. But as far as schedules lining up, the next policy committee meeting is well, September 21st. Okay, let's let the schedule, Liz. Let's I think my Zach question speak. was can more speak? to, I don't want to yeah. do away with second read without knowing how we're going to have an opportunity to amend it. Because I just passed something that's implemented if I did away with second right. read, and I'm not comfortable with that. So, Sorry. I, just, <laughs> I, love your, I love your description of kind of like we're spiritually heading in the direction we want to go, but this is not ready for prime time. So what my concern is, 
is I take the not ready for prime time thing. <laughs> I hand it to Cause, and I say, go out in front of a couple hundred people. Well, I agree with you. Explain yeah. this not ready for prime time okay. thing in an environment where people are hot. Mm -hmm. And it's I like, agree. good luck, buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, go again. get him. Uh, well, so that's what I'm worried about. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're going to change so it again. Shall we continue with the policy we have until the policy committee can make the amendments, come back to the board, and we vote on it? I, I think we need to do one motion at a time, and I think it needs to be with the one on the table. All right, all right. Let's vote on the one on the table. Do we want to approve this as a single reading tonight, right now? And and can I and just one more comment before we close out the comments on this section? Sorry, Nancy. <laughs> is I just sort of want to respond to Lisa as far as why I think one reading is and just overall why I think one reading is important. I think one reading is important so that we have something in place that eliminates. The in the presence of language eliminates the um, uh, losing uh, extracurricular activities um, uh, if you were to have uh, via out of school things, if the out of school things are not substantially disruptive under the JICDD. So essentially, removing the um, out of school activities and having you know having the school be in the business of investigating all these out of school activities unless they're coming into the school and and creating conflict in the classroom essentially no i under i understood all of that Liz. okay i just want to clarify <laughs> that i mean i think I that's why it's important <laughs> so again can we just clarify if you are looking at a single reading of this and that passes through where does that stand for causes August 20th meeting and communicating Garbage. out to parents? Cause. That's my concern. He's got this. Well, it's it's his. There you go, <laughs> yeah. and All right, it's, why, why don't we vote and problem. then we can move on. Nick, can you make it brief? Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, what, what we're looking at here is, I don't think anyone thinks what we're, the, this bill we're looking at JJA is perfect, I think. I, IGD, I have problems with it. I think a lot of us have problems with it, but it, it's standing legislation. Like it has been in place for over a decade, mm -hmm. according to Clayberg. Uh, I, I believe that. Um, but people aren't going to be as mad about something that's been in place for a really long time as something that's changed. So just from a, a simple, what we are going to immediately have to deal with from passing this, standpoint it's going to be a problem additionally even if you don't like the igd policy this i i've really not seen a convincing argument that the current um the the current actual penalty with baked into this is a good system and broadly like if we assume that that's a problem or that that's like a problem with the bill then really the only things we're getting out of it are a few clarifications and the removal of in the presence of which aren't i i really just don't see how that's worth the issues associated with passing it now and then having to then scramble to adjust it well i think we need to take even into passing consideration the right, expectation let, let. we placed with parents as well though because cause did make a referendum to the forms based on what this board was going to do. And so while you may think parents may not get mad, they don't like in the presence of right now. And they do have a set expectation coming forward to that August 20th meeting. Well, so, we, we, we weren't able to come to a conclusion. So parents, if they don't mind, they're just gonna have to wait. until We the have board to vote can, on the motion, Nancy. I know, I'm, I'm trying to get people to vote on it. <laughs> okay, let's vote on the motion. All in favor, raise Aye. your hand. No. I would wait. Lisa, what are we, are we doing motion? a voice vote or a, we're doing a we, we yeah, doing raise a, your all in if favor of the motion yeah. for I have a single I think reading? We're doing suspend a the rules. Suspend the rules to approve on a single reading. Wait. That doesn't mean we're approving it. That means we're suspending the rules to approve on a single reading. All in favor, but, raise your hand, please. Wait, and with it being pended review, and do we no, need a roll call? No, no. Approve the motion is now. just about whether, if it passes or not, is it if it passes, is it a single reading? Yes. But if it's a single reading, then this is what cause is given. Yes. Yes. That's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. And is All, that the expectation that we laid out to yes. cause? You have to vote again. All in Margo. favor. I, I, sing, I sustain are we, it. Are we, doing, um, are we gonna do a roll call? Let's do a roll call vote. I think this is getting can confusing. I think we need a roll call. Sure. That's you. Margo, can you please remind us okay, what so the, the motion on the table, right? So the motion on the table, my understanding of the motion on the table 
is that there was a motion on the table, not about approval yet, about the process by which we would consider approval. Yeah. And the motion is to suspend the normal process of doing two readings, but to have a singular reading tonight, and based on that singular reading, that if you were to confirm the policy, there would be no second reading, that would become the policy. That, yes. Is that my Yes, and we can do amendments as well. So it's not no, just talking this, after he says that. but just suspending the rules, yes. So for now, we're just suspending the rules and it would be a consideration with the singular vote tonight that would, that's a the first thing that's on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, uh, and there was a second, Pip, is that still a second for you based on me restating it or no? Um, yes. Okay, all right. Before we take a vote, can I please understand what the expectation is with the athletic director as it stands? We're, just We're not to on the a policy. single reading. We're just voting on a single reading. So, We're not voting on the policy. So, depending on what happens with the, so whatever the, the, by the time we hit that date, the athletic director, and I'll have to get involved to help, uh, will have to, whatever is eventually passed by the board, would have to explain at the fall meeting what the new expectation is of the board as a result of the new policy. But I feel as a board member, to, for me to give an accurate vote, I need to understand if we are committing for our policy committee to make the changes in due time that, that we can meet those so, expectations of August 20th with our no. athletic director. We can it's make the changes right now no, as I, amendments. I, 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 can, may I respond? Because I think I understand. Go ahead. So we can't, nothing can go to for referral and then back. We can't say make these changes policy committee and you have our pre-approval. No, but we can say that right here and now that we are looking for the policy committee to make the changes prior to August 20th. And as a board, just as Pip said, we policy can approve those changes before the 20th. Well, I think we need to vote on one can we not? Time. Yeah. All right. Let's just vote on this. Is a, so, this policy right. will have a single reading? <laughs> right. When? Oh. Here till okay. To make the so, so right. So that's this does not to confirm the policy at this point. It's just to confirm a process mm -hmm. by which to, to, to consider the policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Liz Barrett. Uh, I made the motion. Yes. Yes. Pip. Yeah, it's, <laughs> not, it's not clear. I know, I seconded it. Does that mean I have to vote? Well, no, oh, yeah, does I mean, not. No. no. Oh, I'd like knowledge. to abstain, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Rappaport. No. Okay. Ann Walker. No. Margaret Peepee. Yes. Nancy Clark. No. Bo Van Epps. Yes. Brian is not with us. Carrie. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, well, right, right now, now, based on with the on with the abstention, you. so we've got a, so we've got <laughs> four to three four votes in the affirmative, okay. three in the negative, <laughs> one abstention. Uh, and one abstention. So it passes. Motion passes. Pass. Right. So this this policy will be dealt with in a single reading. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now I have a motion. Do, yes. Um, I would like to make a motion to consider striking just the phrase in the presence of from IGD and then send this back to the policy committee for further amendments and return it to the board. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Answer. Shall we have a, oh, Liz, come um, on Liz, keep it brief. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, if we followed the motions from the beginning, it would have been brief, but I, Liz. you know, the thing, the thing is is that the reason why it's not just in the presence of language there's there's all this business of out of school activities and out of school things and and the police involvement and out of school and i think that i think we need to get out of the business and i think that's what I've, we've heard that we need to get out of the business of of uh, providing punitive so i think we need to do more than just um in the presence of i understand the concern i understand that this policy is not perfect and i understand that there's still edits to be needed that are needed but i don't think that this what we have right here is completely off because we have JICDD and we have the which covers the 
the uh, discipline may be imposed out of school conduct causes significant disruption or substantial interference in the school's educational mission person objectives so i think that provides some context if it were to come into school but i don't think the school should continue to be in the business of um working counterproductive with the um with the state and the state statutes which are supposed to be uh restorative and not punitive so i mean i would suggest instead of instead of going that direction what i would suggest or employ the board to do is to take a look at the second the, there's a second on that we have to vote know, on a motion we're, it's under discussion right now what i okay, what i'd implore you, the board to do is can, continue can you with this it up please well, yes would continue with this policy but amend this policy and remove what you don't like from it for the time being like if you don't you know if there's a couple sections like the ineligibility from the student, student conduct committee i mean jicdd jicd and jic they all cover everything that needs to be covered the only purpose of this policy really is to um say who's a, who's eligible to participate to you know help include the homeschoolers and and whatnot but those other jic policies are the ones that cover our students within our school do we so, have more discussion on the motion and if not we'll vote sounds on it. like all that can be discussed in the policy, in the policy committee. committee meeting yes yeah, carrie what committee. would you like to say I, we were here three months ago in my mind where we proposed that or discussed that, eliminating that. And I don't recall all the specifics, but I remember getting to the point of understanding that didn't solve the problem and didn't address things. So I just want to point that out that um, to me, I'm not in favor of this because the process at that discussion where we came to consensus on striking that one statement was a bad idea was to refer to the policy committee have this and now we're here and i am in in favor of voting on this policy as is um because i'm, I'm it's a little deja vu for me from a few months ago and carrie i agree with you i think that we did go back and forth on that phrase quite a lot but i also believe fundamentally that we have no way of knowing whether those kids were drinking they were not in trouble with the police mm -hmm. we don't know they weren't drinking but we don't know they were and I think that there are many fundamental problems with both the original policy and there's a lot of things we need to clean up in this before it's really ready to be rolled out. And so I feel like in terms of where our administrators are coming from and wanting a clear mandate to give mm -hmm. the kids and the coaches and the advisors in three weeks, mm -hmm. they know the old policy. In my mind, the biggest problem with that policy was the in the presence of. And we heard that from a lot of people in our community, not just at that one party, but in many other circumstances. So that is the spirit of this motion, not to stop the process, but just to perhaps try to correct one problem if we're in agreement with the old policy while we continue to work on this draft, which is, I think, has a lot of good elements, and kick it back to policy and then bring it back to the board. So that was my thinking. Okay, there's a motion on the table. Lisa, can you repeat that motion? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> motion to strike the phrase in the presence of from IGD and direct the policy committee to continue making revisions to what are discussion. we now calling this policy? JJA. JJA. <laughs> and to get back to the board so that we can vote on it and then get it to the community by August 20th can't do that I would put yeah, period yeah, where I, I, yes, I just period. said that what's on the table the motion Liz, that's on the I, table is to approve right, Liz, this policy Liz, that stop. we have in front of us Liz, stop you can't right just now create let another, Lisa another talk. motion yes, let Lisa talk it's her motion I already created the motion to spend the rules to vote on this I know no let, you let, didn't she actually com she actually brought her motion forward vote, you motion brought to spend the rules, you brought though. your information forward in discussion okay. Liz it's on record that you even said that we were in discussion okay, her Lisa, motion is can, on the table can you repeat that motion please i can try i mean mm -hmm. i <laughs> i believe it was i think it was strike to strike in the presence of from igd and to direct the policy committee to continue working on a new draft of what we're now calling J A A. J J A. yes i'm going to do it on the fifth time which All means right. on august 20th Cause would have a policy that he can stand by that they are familiar with, with one removal of edit, as well as inform parents that this policy is still in review for on. changes and will be looked at in our fall. Okay. Do, and did we get a second? Thank you, Hope. Did we get a second? 
Can't remember. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess we need a roll call. Is that okay, Zach? Well, are we still doing comment? Because I have a comment. I just don't think this is appropriate. Because I think so the process. Really no. Can I speak? Because I'm just, just vote gonna... no, Liz. No, but I think the process, though, I suspended the rules to do one reading of what we have in front of us today, not what Lisa just did, but what we have in front of us today. That is what is on the table. That was what was on the agenda. This was on the agenda. No. Not what Lisa what had mentioned. What we voted on was that a single okay. reading okay. would pass this policy eventually to approve That's, this policy that was in no, front of us in the agenda we Nancy. approved no. that one reading would be enough for this policy that's what we voted on okay let's vote on this one so i think please. we have to do that first and say whether we're going to go with this or not oh. first before we go to another like version no, of we're this policy vote on this motion that lisa just made and mm. this is, this is what, end the but this discussion. is what's in front I, of us I, nancy I, no, oh, this was, I think that, this is the that same was in the packet, thing. though. I think this is the same thing. I think we are voting on this policy. That's right. She but we're voting with the JC. new, uh, based on the motion that she has just made. But I'm we already voted on your motion. I understand and we that. we approved it. And now we're voting on her motion, which point. does impact this <laughs> policy. Point, point no, I get that. But I think the thing is, is that we have to vote on this version of the policy first, as far as this no, is what was in the Liz, packet. We don't. We don't. We don't. We just voted that whatever policy we pass is right. going to be a separate oh, reading. Rules. That's what we voted on. So but, let's have a roll call on what on Lisa's Carrie motion. Carrie does have her hand up over there. Mm -hmm. and oh, Pat who does? Hand up. Carrie. Sorry, sorry, I just see, I see, I, I see Liz's point on that we're not, usually a first reading, second reading is to enact a policy. And the motion that Lisa made is not to enact a policy, it's to modify one. So I don't, I, I, was, I don't know It's my where... understanding that the policy we vote on will have a single reading. No. It's not this policy. It's whatever policy is eventually put together, we will vote on on a single reading. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So in future tense. Right. So when okay. this, it, so when when this comes amended, back, okay. it's, it's a It's all reading. the same policy. It's just that the policy is changing right. code and it, names it will be a single in reading, the future. Not a double, a technically. Reading, so, whatever, so. Okay. okay, let's vote on Lisa's. Nick has hand up. Oh, Nick. Um, I, I was just trying to get clarification. I think I understand now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So do we need a roll call vote or uh, a hand well, vote Well, all right. Let's what? do all in favor of taking of Lisa's me uh, motion. Can, I think we need can to do I a roll point call. Point of clarification on, on, the, on the motion. So the motion is the, because I heard two different things being discussed, or maybe two different things. So Lisa, your motion is the existing IGD as proposed by the committee or the okay. existing IDG Fair. as it is on the books right now. So my cross out the one to which of the two is that? Take the IGD on the books. Yeah. Okay. That is in full force right now. Yep. And just strike that one clause. In the present. While time. we direct the policy committee to continue working on the revised version of the policy. And also if we don't known have as JJA. Otherwise known as JJA. JJA. What is a JJA? Okay. Okay. You still second okay. that based on that understanding of yes i yes. do okay all right go ahead zach <laughs> okay all right so so anybody have any need any clarification no <laughs> original igd Please the motion the is original vote. okay got it here we go uh, i'm um, sorry yes one clarification yes when and if uh jja replaces igd how will we ensure that that new amended thing is then re-educated to yeah, athletes, okay. students, parents, because they're going to sign one. Yep. So then do we need to resubmit, sign again, have another meeting to go through it? I just want to make sure on the record that that will be the process, because that's apparent to my vote. I, I feel uncomfortable that if we approve mm -hmm. this removal and athletes sign it, and then three weeks later a change is made, mm -hmm. yeah. that's an act of then, we then need to re-sign and re-educate. I, th I think anytime you change a po I think anytime we change a policy, we should be cognizant of who are the people it is affecting and how are we communicating that the policy has changed. So if that's a anytime you change a policy that affects staff, we should have a process by which staff are very clearly educated as to what yeah. the heck is happening. Um, same thing with other other folks. So now, what whether or not the logistics, what I what I can't, what's hard for me to commit to right now, or what are the logistics of taking. And the way it was described to me was 300 people um, and getting those 300 people back together again in a singular space to do it in exactly the same way it's probably going to be difficult because we're in season people are going different places we've got things going on 
but the same you know the same veracity of the way in which we would try to communicate it as we did I mean at the, my understanding of the meeting as it's been described to me is this is the initial cause portion of the show a um, little bit of principle I think there's gonna be a little bit of principle a little bit of me and then it's out with your teams and you're having the conversation with your teams so we would not be able to I, I think we would struggle to replicate the exact same thing for three six weeks into a season uh, in the exact same way. So if that's your question, then I would say probably no, we would struggle. Um, can we can we try to kind of, you know, do something that spiritually is in line with the same level of, of multimedia way to try to educate people? I think we can find a way to do that. Yeah, and can I just um, say that when I met with high school um, administration, one of the things that was discussed and actually received very well by them um, at, at their invitation was us being able to earmark um, policies that were under review so that they were aware of which policies were under review and aware of the language of the policy. So I think, again, going back to we can't communicate everything out right now, Zach, but what can we communicate out? We can communicate out August 20th that this is still under review, that you can see the revisions that are being considered wherever the policy committee puts those, and that's also an opportunity for the policy committee to receive feedback from administration and parents as well before anything is fully submitted. Okay, okay. are we ready for the vote? Liz, no. Um, Liz. So, I mean, coming from the policy committee, I'm just concerned with this because um, we're still. Liz, you don't listen, have to vote for Nancy, it. If Nancy, Nancy, listen. If not, I, I need to be able to say my piece to this because we spent a lot of time in policy committee, three hours, and then we spent several hours on yes, Friday, and, and we came you, to this. Okay. Over so and listen, over no, again. I haven't though. I wanted to respond, and what my response is is that if we do that, we're still giving our kids a punitive approach when the police and anybody that's getting involved with them outside of school is trying to do a therapeutic approach. So we're not taking that therapeutic and restorative approach that's in JIC, JICD, and it's counterproductive. So we came to this. This is what the policy committee came to, we worked on. It still needs work, but given what Zach is saying as far as getting everybody back together and da 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 da, I think that we owe it to our kids and we owe it to our families to give them a therapeutic approach, give the high school principal some leeway to be able to come up with consequences and whatnot because the old policy lays out punitive consequences to our kids. And I don't think we should still be doing that. Okay. And I think we need to Thank get away from it. And that's Thank why you. this is on the table. Thank you, Liz. Okay, let's have a roll call vote. Okay. Um, uh, Liz Barrett. No. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rapport. Yes. Ann Walker. No. Margo Peabody. Abstain. Okay. All right. <laughs> I thought that was a really low no. Or that. I, I thought you said no. Uh, I said abstain. All right. Uh, uh, Nancy. No. Uh, Hope. Yes. Uh, Carrie. <laughs> yes. So f four, uh, four in favor, one uh, abstention, uh, three opposed. So it passes. Okay, so we're going back to the policy committee. Now, Margo, what is the timeline for the policy committee? It, it'll be a while. The, the, what Liz okay. has so eloquently pointed out is that it is, you will not see this policy again if I'm going back to our calendar until our October okay. meeting. It, but, why, but why can we not, as a board, request? this policy it's, get reviewed it but, is I mean, but our I, next policy the, the next availability for the policy committee meeting policy team to meet that we could find with all of those moving parts is the 21st of september oh, so they, already that's actually about that. we've already set our next meeting that was the earliest we could all settle on okay so that's not a r being difficult that is that's the reality of when that entire group of players can get back together I would like to take a look at some point of our policy committee schedule and our board meeting schedules because it does seem like we keep bumping up against this of a huge delays and we've ran into this around this policy multiple times that the delay uh, is the I'll say this the practice is that policies are supposed to come up to the board 
at the first meeting of the month. So the policy committee tries to meet in the middle. So there's ample time to get it, revise it, and get it in the board packet before the first meeting of the month. But to your point, it hasn't always it hasn't always, it hasn't always laid out like the that. way. And in theory, I, that's what it was right. supposed to be. And while I appreciate that, this particular policy moved through a motion of not following that schedule, of following a schedule of workshops like our budget workshop and operating outside of those normalcies. So mm -hmm. I just want to point that out. Yep. Yep. Okay. I think we can move on to the next item on the agenda. Now I lost my agenda. No, I think that's the one. one. I would like, like to make a motion. We're like, we're, 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 we're together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. That was a spirited, really passionate discussion, oh. and I think well. you'll all work. We'll all work real hard to have the final resolution. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay. The next. I'd like to make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, can we? We're going to go, th we're go moving on to the next item. I think okay. that's what her motion's on. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, 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 okay. To okay. I think she just wants a back. Can we do a batch? Yes. yes. Okay. Consideration <laughs> and approval of employment. Um, Zach, do you want to uh, quickly review these? Or? Yeah, I, I would, you know, we uh, had an opportunity um, in non public to, uh, to look at some of these folks, but you have um, several different positions across the district. Um, the, uh, all have gone through typical processes um, and our final final recommendations from principals and uh, we'd like your approval for the batch do we have a motion to approve the new so hires moved. do we have a second second Liz. Oh, Liz. okay thank you Liz all in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you passes uh, thank you <laughs> committee updates we have policy under <laughs> <laughs> the motion to motion to remove policy committee updates from the agenda. <laughs> Second. Okay. <laughs> Upcoming events. Do we, uh, Kim, do you want to talk about that? I well, I wanted to give you an update on the Portsmouth 400. Um, they're going to be meeting August 15th. If anybody anybody wants to attend it will be on zoom and there I lost my post-it there are um, three interviews that were done you were asking me about that oh yes um, yep. Ruth Griffin oh. White House Farrell. and a Ted Ted I lost my post-it Ted, um, <laughs> Ted talk no, no, not Ted talk. Teddy Connors okay. was that the other one Ted Connors Hold on I'll pull it back up Marlon sent me a beautiful update um, no, not that. Those are the um, interviews that the students are doing with prominent Portsmouth residents. Oh, so they talked um, to Whitey? Um, talked to Whitey. Yes, they talked to Harold. So. <laughs> what do you mean, Whitey Bulger? <laughs> yeah, no, Whitey. not Whitey yeah, that, Bulger. That's not Whitey Bulger. He is not <laughs> part probably of Ted, Ted Connors. Oh, sorry. He's in jail, isn't he? <laughs> no one knows. Okay. All right, hold up, hold up. I'm going to find this. Uh, it must be Ted Connors. He was a former yes, mayor. Ted, that's it. Ted Connors. Yes. Um, and they're trying to get the um, Portsmouth uh, public television um, equipment so that they can do more. Um, and the, the interviewings w were suspended for the summer just because it was really hard to meet with people. Um, so the oral histories will pick back up. And the meeting is the 15th on Zoom, and you probably got the link. I, yeah, I have that. Um, okay. So I did have that update. And um, we'll look into why our meeting wasn't on Zoom tonight. Lisa, good yeah. point yeah. you brought up. I yeah. don't know how that happened. Wasn't, but again, wasn't uh, purposeful. Right. As far as we'll I know. be sure to make sure that yeah. comes back. Um, um, does anyone else have anything? Yes, Hope. So I just wanted to do an update, and people's going to be like, the what? Um, on the SWAG committee, which is actually a city council committee. It's the yep. Safe Advisory Watery Group, but I sit on the committee as a um, school board representative. And um, we did have DHHS come and present to us, and they presented some interesting information around New Hampshire students and lead poisoning. I'm not trying to send a PSA out that there's lead poisoning amongst our students, so please don't write in about that. <laughs> but um, 
There are a lot of opportunities that were brought up from DHHS um, in their lead poisoning department and just around lead education and water um, sampling opportunities as well as some lead certifications that our school may be able to partner with. Um, they've done some serious work with Claremont schools, and so I just want to throw that out there. It's just in early stages of discussion. It's something that we'll be talking with our good superintendent and assistant <laughs> superintendent more about it and a lot of other parties that might be able to come into play. But um, it may be something that we might be bringing back um, for a presentation opportunity as they did present to the city council as well as um, the school board of Claremont and helping pass some um, lead testing policies, opt-in lead testing policies for their school district. Thank you. Thank you for sitting on that committee. You're welcome. That sounds interesting. Nancy, any other? Yes. I think procedurally we have to do a motion to send IDB back or whatever, JJA back to the policy committee because I don't, you know, we did a motion, the motion to approve, but we didn't do a motion. motion to send back to the. That was part of the motion. Yeah, that was part of the motion. You voted not to. You voted not to. Okay, well, <laughs> anything else anybody would like to bring up? I think it should be separate. The school board said no. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. It was a good.